There are 248 town meeting members, 125 constitutes a quorum. The constable informs me that a quorum is present. The sixth session of the 260th annual town meeting will now come to order. At the end of tonight's session, there will be a motion to adjourn to tomorrow night, Thursday, May 17th. If this motion passes, we will meet again tomorrow night. If the motion fails, there will be another motion to adjourn until next Monday, May 21st. A motion to adjourn is not debatable. When considering your vote, you must balance the difficulty of meeting three times in a week with the difficulty of achieving a quorum as we extend further into the spring. The auditorium has been reserved for five additional dates beyond May 21st. The seats on the floor of the auditorium may be occupied only by town meeting members except for the front row, which may be used by members of the press and by members of town committees and town staff participating in the presentation of discuss or discussion of articles. Such persons must wear non-voter stickers, which are available at the check-in table. Spectators and town residents who are not town meeting members may be seated in the bleachers to the rear of the auditorium. New information for town meeting members can be found on the back table to my left. Old information can be found on the back table to my right. Amherst Media provides gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of our proceedings on Public Access Channel 17, and I'd like to thank their staff and volunteers. If you wish to speak, you must raise your hand and be recognized. You must hold up a card to indicate your position. Green indicates yes, red indicates no, and a white card indicates that you wish to speak without advocacy or ask a question. When you are called on, please first state your name and precinct. If you forget, I will interrupt and ask you to do so. If you need more than three minutes or more than five when speaking to your motion, you must request additional time before speaking and town meeting will vote on your request. Non-members who wish to speak should stand at the rear of the right-hand aisle. Any registered voter of the town of Amherst who is recognized by the moderator may speak without special permission. Others may speak with the permission of a majority. Please stand when you speak if you are physically able to do so. Also, please wait for the microphone before speaking. And when you are hold, when you're speaking into the microphone, hold it like this. Notice I'm holding it horizontal right up to my mouth. That's the way the sound works best. That's the way that the soundboard can most easily control your volume, volume so everybody can hear you. If you're making an amendment to a motion, the amendment must be presented in writing with four copies submitted to the following people or groups, town clerk, moderator, town manager, staff, and the chair of the finance committee or whichever board is seated to my left. Procedural motions, such as a motion to refer or a motion to dismiss, do not need to be presented in writing. If you make any motion from the floor, it must be the first thing you do after you've been recognized and have identified yourself. You cannot speak first and then make a motion. If you have not already done so, please check your cell phone and make sure it is silenced or off. If at any point in time you are confused about the proceedings, it is appropriate to call a point of order and ask for a clarification. Also, it's always okay to phone me, send me an email, or see me prior to town meeting if you need an explanation of any kind. We're now going to do our electronic voting test. You should all have your devices. They should all be on so you can see your device number on the LED screen. Anybody having any issues with their electronic voting device? Everybody can see the way they voted on their screen. See, yes, 102, no, 140, no, 48. Mr. Wald, I again totally forget which is the correct answer. No? The answer is no. The no's win. Okay, we have, I'm going to be calling first on Ms. Tileman to make a procedural motion, and then I should warn everybody there's going to be some complicated procedural things happening this evening, so gird yourselves and be prepared. Um, Ms. Tileman is going to be making a motion to hear the free cash article, Article 25, at the next town meeting session at 7.05. She's not going to specify a date, sir 
certain because we don't have a date certain. The next meeting might be Thursday or might be Monday. She's moving the free cash article to a future date because we may be spending more money tonight. We don't know. So, Ms. Tomlin, you can make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move to hear Article 25 at the next session of town meeting at 7.05. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, you can speak your motion if you want, but I think I already explained it. Any discussion? I see no hands. All those in favor of the motion to move Article 25 to the next town meeting session at 7 o'clock, which is fine to do, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. It's been moved. So what's on our agenda for this evening, first we're going to hear Article 39 because we moved it to a date time certain for tonight. Then we're going to hear Article 27 because we moved that to a date time certain tonight. At that point, I am going to be accepting a motion to reconsider the elementary school portion of Article 8. And we will have a discussion and vote on whether or not we want to reconsider. I hear a point of order. Mr. Moderator, I assume that you would allow the motion for reconsider to go before the motion dealing with free cash, since we No, you, 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 um, you missed what just happened. We just no, moved I... free cash to the next session oh, of town thank you, meeting. Thank you. Sorry, sir. Thank you. So, but we're looking ahead. For, first, we're doing Article 39, then we're doing Article 27. So I now call on Ms. Turner to make a motion under Article 39. Molly Turner, Precinct um, Get one. that microphone real close to your mouth if you can. Yeah, Paul, give her a hand. There we go. I think yeah, there's one. Uh, Molly Turner, Precinct 1. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move in terms of the article, except to replace the final paragraph with the following. And therefore, be it further resolved that upon passage, the Amish town clerk shall mail copies of the revolution, resolution and vote to President Donald Trump, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Ed Markey, Congressman Jim McGovern, Governor Charlie Baker, Speaker of the Massachusetts House, Robert DeLeo, Acting President of the Massachusetts Senate, Harriet Chandler, and Representative Solomon Goldstein Rose. I hear the second. Your motion has been made and seconded. It's my understanding that we have three speakers who are not town meeting members who brought this petition article to town meeting, and they were going to share the five minutes among them. So that's Cameron Gray Lee and Rowan Alfowell and Tessa Kowal. You can come forward. I hear a point of order. Wait for a microphone, please. Uh, Rob Kessner, Precinct 3. Ms. Turner uh, very carefully made sure she. Ah, the mo okay, I got it. Thank you. Senator Rosenberg. You may sit. Okay, um, so, would you strike Senator Rosenberg from the motion because he's not in the motion? He's not the senator. Thank you. So you may speak to the motion, and you have five minutes. Good evening. I'm Ruan Elfawal, and here with me are Tessa Kaywal and Cameron Gray. We are part of the Team Jaguar Takes on Climate Change Committee, or TJ Talk. We are seventh grade students from the Amherst Regional Middle School who are working to pass Article 39, which is a resolution in support of the Paris Climate Agreement. The 2015 Paris Climate Agreement is an official agreement between all countries in the world, besides Syria and Nicaragua. Countries involved agreed to keep global temperature rise under two degrees Celsius. They also agreed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28% below 2005 levels by 2025. 
On June 1st, 2017, President Trump announced that the U.S. would stop all participation in the Paris Climate Agreement. Article 39 is a resolution for Amherst to stand by the Paris Climate Agreement by adapting its greenhouse gas emission reduction goal. If it passes, we are asking the Amherst town clerk to mail copies of the resolution and vote to President Donald Trump, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Ed Markey, Congressman Jim McGovern, Governor Charlie Baker, Speaker of the Massachusetts House Robert DeLeo, Acting President of the Massachusetts Senate Harriet Chandler, and Representative Solomon Goldstein Rose. Many cities in the U.S. have come out to support the Paris Climate Agreement, and we think that it is time that Amherst does too. This is not a political issue, it's a universal one. Democratic and Republican towns alike are altering their ways of life to help stop climate change. In places such as Burlington, Vermont, and Georgetown, Texas, people are already adjusting their lifestyles and making a big impact. There are numerous communities in Massachusetts that have decided to stand by the Paris Climate Agreement. Boston, Northampton, Holyoke, and many more Massachusetts towns and cities have agreed to support it. There's a whole range of possible next steps Amherst could take in order to meet this goal. We understand a sustainability committee is in planning stages. We urge the town to set it up by September so the committee can help with next steps toward implementing this resolution. We would also like to explore having student representation on the committee, since you can see our committee in back there. This would allow individuals to speak for the youth passion surrounding this issue. Amherst should investigate switching existing buildings to clean energy, such as geothermal, wind, or solar. Our fellow students on Team Lycanthrope have started to look into putting solar panels on our school. We support their goal. We could use Community Preservation Act funds to create new bike paths. We could adopt a complete streets policy like Northampton and Springfield, where every street has a bike path and sidewalk. Along with these suggestions, there are many more steps Amherst could take. We encourage you to explore every avenue because there's no one solution to climate change. Amherst is a small town, but even small towns can make a big impact. Imagine if every town in the US supported the Paris Climate Agreement. We can't control every town, but we can choose for Amherst to make the right decision. Our town can, can inspire other communities, as some towns have done for us. We are passionate about this because it is a step towards changing our world. By asking Amherst to pass this resolution and take meaningful actions, we can move towards a better future for our diverse planet. The children of the town are banding together to change this horrific problem. We deserve a future with a safe and healthy planet. We, the next generation, have powerful voices, but we need your help. Help us and future generations to come by supporting our resolution. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If you want, you can stay seated up here in case there are any questions, or you can go back there, whichever you want. And does the select board have a position or wish to make a statement? No. And finance committee, any statement or position? No. So this will require a majority vote. It is a resolution, and we are now open to discussion. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We will now come to a vote. This requires a majority. All those in favor of the motion before you on the screen, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's a unanimous vote. Unanimous vote. We do not applaud at town meeting, so we are done, you guys. We now, if I've got my numbers right, are moving on to Article 27. And I call on Mr. Slaughter to make a motion. I move in terms of the article except to replace the text that begins with the phrase, provided, however, that the town, with the following language, 
provided, however, that the town shall not provide a conditional commit to convey said property to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust until the town council determines that a feasible project meeting the above objectives has been identified and shall not convey such property until financing commitments have been obtained and key permits have been secured. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. So the uh, select board recommends this to you unanimously. Um, I will state the following. Uh, th this is, uh, we're getting into those topics within the, uh, the warrant that start to beg the question of, of some of the charter transition provisions and the select board, while considering those amongst all the articles on the warrant, have certainly taken it up in a little more detail on some articles versus others. We felt that this article was one that was in keeping with the transition provisions within uh, the charter, and so therefore we recommend it to you. Uh, we think that the delay in not passing this or waiting till later to take up this topic of, of, uh, of affording the uh, affordable housing trusts, the opportunity to convey the property uh, would negatively impact the ability to, to move ahead with uh, affordable housing goals that the town has. Um, and for those reasons, the select board recommends this to you. Thank you. Now calling on Mr. Hornick for the housing trust. John Hornick, town meeting member, precinct seven, and chair of the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust. I request seven minutes. Mr. Hornick has requested an additional four minutes. We're gonna have a very quick vote on it. All those in favor of granting the additional four minutes, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. You've got it, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and members of town meeting. The Housing Trust seeks to encourage the development of 250 units of affordable housing in Amherst for both low-income families and individuals. These are goals that were set out in the 2013 Housing Production Plan, but on which only minimal progress has been made. In order to do this, we expect to plan projects that will be developed by others, as well as supporting projects initiated by developers that incorporate affordable housing units. One opportunity to reach our goals is to use existing town-owned land. At present, we are looking carefully at the East Street School property. The purpose of this article is to provide the housing trust with assurance that the town will support this proposed reuse. This is a complicated project. In order to explain it, I will begin with a brief history and current description of the East Street School property itself, and then go on to describe the steps toward development that the Housing Trust expects to take. If you look at the property map behind me, you will see about 2.2 acres across from the East Street Common. The front part of the property includes the school itself. The back lot is now a recreational field used by uh, children for soccer, frisbee, basketball, etc. The school was originally built in the 19th century but was destroyed by fire. A new school was built in, in its place in 1936 and served Amherst children as recently as the 1990s as overflow classroom space for Fort River. Solomon Goldstein Rose told me that his third grade class was located there. Since then, the school has had various uses, including a home for the Yiddish Book Center and a special high school program. The town looked carefully at renovating the school to become offices and classroom space for Amherst Leisure Services three or four years ago. However, the challenges and associated costs in rehabbing the building were so high that the project was abandoned. The school has been vacant for at least five years but the town continued to maintain it at a cost of roughly $30,000 to $35,000 per year. So it looked to the housing trust like there is a town property that is worth investigating as a potential site for affordable housing. We are still a long way from actually proceeding with the development. 
My next task is to describe what we are doing to determine whether this is feasible or not in 10 simple steps. Not really, but. Step one, talk to the select board and town manager. We did that and received positive feedback. We also talked briefly with the historical commission and we'll talk with the school committee in June. Um, step two, hire a consultant to determine whether there are wetlands on the site, which would make it impossible to build. We did that and we received bad news. The back part of the property, which is in yellow, is entirely wetlands. No one can build there. It will likely remain recreational space for the foreseeable future. However, the front part of the lot is on higher ground and could be used for building. I'm gonna leave you without the map and go on. Step three, hire consultants to do the following. A, a site survey of the property. B, an analysis of whether the school building can be reused for affordable house apartments and three, development of options for how the property can best be used for housing. We are in the process of writing contracts to do this work. The results will determine whether and how we would go forward with this project. Assuming that we do decide to go forward, there are, of course, more steps to take. Step four, seek feedback from town citizens on what the trust thinks we should do. This would include a fall housing forum at which design ideas would be presented. We also expect to develop a way to communicate about this online and receive online feedback. Step five, develop a request for proposals in which developers would bid on the project, describing what they would do with the property and what financing support they would seek from the state, the town, and possibly other sources. Step five, seek approval from town council for releasing the request for proposals. This is critical because the RFP would commit the town to transferring the property to the successful bidder after she or he had submitted final development plans as well as meeting all financing and licensing requirements. Step seven, release the RFP Evaluate the bids and contract with the successful bidder. Step eight, meet with the Amherst Historical Commission again and request permission either to renovate the school building or to demolish it, whichever alternative becomes most appropriate. The Historical Commission would almost certainly hold its own public hearing. Step nine, monitor the initial development work of the contractor and formally transfer ownership of the property once all contractual requirements had been met. Step 10, a ribbon cutting, cutting ceremony and move in for the first occupants of the building. That's a bit oversimplified, but I wanted to give you an overview of how this project would proceed. Almost at any point, the project would be stopped if the housing trust determines that an obstacle has appeared, which makes it impossible to move forward. There are three formal opportunities for public input at steps five, six, and eight. In addition, the monthly meetings of the housing trust are open to all. Although the approval of this body is not final, it is important to the housing trust. It provides us with the authority to move forward with the steps that I have outlined and will give prospective contractors confidence in considering whether to bid on this project. We believe that uh, affordable housing is important to Amherst and we ask your support in developing this project. At its last meeting on May 10th, the Housing Trust voted seven to zero to support this article with one member absent. I ask that you join us in moving this forward. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Ratner for the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Finance Committee recommends this article by a vote of six to zero with one absent. And the only thing I would add to what's been said previously is that um, building housing on this property could possibly um, 
generate some property tax as income for the town. Thank you. This will require a two-thirds vote for passage because we are um, transferring the supervision or ownership of property from one entity to another. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? I see a hand in the back row with a red card. Mark Kasarik, Precinct 9. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. You might recall a few years ago, the last time we had a discussion about this property, Manager Musanti addressed meeting trying to inspire us, and successfully so, to appropriate, actually I think it was a bond, bond funding for so many hundreds of thousands of dollars to rectify water damage, a leaking roof, and so forth. And at the time, he told us one of the reasons he had an appreciation of this property is because of, quote, the craftsmanship. He had inspected it, done various tours, and he was very impressed with the quality. I share his sentiments. From grade one to four, I was first exposed to the building. And over the decades, I've had many conversations with former teachers and staff members and students, and they all told me what a special place this is. One former teacher told me she considered it to have a magical ambiance. And I can appreciate that. It was in that location that I first developed a penchant for learning, and for the next 17 years, I decided to do all my education in Amherst. But it's not just my personal past that gives me reason to be concerned about this article. I feel that the building still has pedagogical potential. It has, not too long ago, been used as the Fort River School Annex, accommodating the overflow. That was in the 90s. And in the early 2000s, it was the alternative high school. Earlier, it had the role of being the National Yiddish Book Exchange. That was from 1981 to 1992. I even had an interview with the person who called in the fire alarm in early 1936. And one of the reasons he did so is because he was a student there and he definitely wanted to save it. And the interior of the school was rebuilt, but the exterior shell did remain and we can see it today with its beautiful Romanesque arch and the nice warm brickwork. I'm also concerned about propinquity, or should I say proximity to the historical district. Nearby we find the Dickinson Bags Tavern, the Noah Dickinson House, the JCA in its historic structure. It seems to me that a continuing academic use for this building has a better congruence with a historical district. I'm also worried about precedent. Will this be the first town-owned valuable asset that we're going to be divesting ourselves of? So for those Finish reasons, up, I urge you to vote no. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. I see a hand in the middle. Mr. Hornick, you should probably just be seated, so in case someone else wants to come to the podium. Yes, I saw a hand in the third row center there. Gordon Freed, Precinct 6. I think I have a couple of points. Um, my daughter spent several years there because there was mold in the Fort River School. I don't think it was there because they needed the space. Second of all, um, it, the mold was in the Fort River School and she got shunted around various places, including there. Um, the other question I have is the playing fields. Will we be looking to transfer those playing fields to the housing authority also? Um, or the, I'm sorry, to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust? And my third question was going to be, and I'm not going to make this motion, I can't at this point, is should this decision be delayed um, until more information on the housing trust is known, or does this just give them the opportunity to 
pursue the information. Um, nobody has to respond, but if somebody wants to. Is there further discussion? Yes, Ms. Talman. Uh, just some information. Once this is deeded over to the contractor, construction person, um, and things don't go well, or in time they choose to sell this property, what is the role of the town in that? This is a fairly valuable piece of property, um, and it appears we're giving it to a group with a lot of provisions, I understand that, but I guess I'm curious as to how the town will get some revenue back from this. Mr. Hornick. Let me respond to a few of the comments that were made. First, with respect to the future of the school building, we are gonna hire a consulting architect to evaluate the building and to determine whether it can be reused. If it is, that will be part of our plan. If it can't, then it won't be. Um, second, we really just learned last week about the wetlands and the recreational area that abuts the, or is part of the larger piece of property. My guess is that we would, ex we would separate the two parcels or separate the land into two parcels so that the recreation area would not be deeded to a contractor but would stay for the town. Third, with respect to what a contractor can do, um, the resolution or the warrant article limits us to using the property for housing with a minimum of 25% affordable. I know my own preference in the trust is uh, to make it 100% affordable if we can do that. That means that that would be a part of any contract with a developer so that the developer would not be free to take the property and use it for something else. In fact, formally the property doesn't get turned over until they've reached a point where the development has been com completed. What's important, I think, about this or the resolution is that at the point at which we contract with the developer, we are promising that if she or he follows through in building the development that is planned, in arranging for financing, and in getting appropriate licensing, then they get site control, which is what you need in order to go to licensing authorities, what you need in order to go to the state to ask for financing. So the property really doesn't get turned over until the project is pretty much finished. On the other hand, you can't wait till then to promise the property. You really have to give what's called site control over to the developer before they can proceed to meet those requirements. Thank you. Um, yes, way over in the corner there. Rudy Perkins, Precinct 2. Um, I was involved with the Olympia Oaks development, which is on town land, and that was done as a 99-year ground lease, which gave the town an additional layer of control beyond the affordable housing restrictions. Um, is it my understanding? Well, <laughs> let me ask the question. It looks like this doesn't necessarily preclude such an arrangement, and I wonder if the housing trust would also explore something like that. Mr. Hornick? Sorry, my apologies. Um, absolutely. It, it isn't only a matter of would we explore it, we'd really be required to do that. If the developer receives funding from the Department of Housing Community Development, if the developer receives funding from Community Preservation Act funds, then those would be built-in requirements in return for receiving that funding. So Thank again, you. I haven't told you everything because uh, I limited myself to seven minutes, which I didn't quite make, but I did the best I could. Further discussion? Um, yes, right here in the front, second row from the front. Uh, Carol Gray, Precinct 7. 
I, I certainly think we need more affordable housing um, badly. Um, but I don't, I'm worried that this is not the right vehicle to do it with and that this is setting a precedent that is dangerous for getting the kind and quantity of affordable housing that we want. What I mean by that is that the article says 25% affordable housing. Why not? I, I, I appreciate that you're gonna try for 100, but it only says 25, and it says 80% of the median. Well, you can have three different tiers of affordable housing. There's 50% the median, which is you know, low-income people. 80% means almost, almost the average people. Um, and then there's 30% the median, which would be habitat houses. This doesn't allow for any truly low-income people to have housing. Also, I was doing some research about affordable housing trusts in other places. Cambridge apparently is the state-of-the-art model. They've used millions, many millions, of CPA funds to create huge amounts of affordable housing. And their housing, affordable housing trust only works with nonprofits. They're not giving away assets to private developers who need to make profits, and that's their main motivation. Um, I really worry about... Um, we've got a few lovely historic buildings that, um, it, for, for all the reasons that were said by, by Mark, I, don't, I think that there should be studies on historic buildings before we decide to turn them over. For all the reasons I just said just now, I think that we need to have an affordable housing trust modeled like Cambridge working with nonprofits and getting affordable housing for each tier of not just the like almost wealthy people who can do 80%. How about the low income, the 50%? You know, what about teachers? You know, they could they be the 80% the median? What about firefighters? We probably if we want to get working class people affordable housing, we need something that's 50% the median. We need some that's 30% the median, and we need to work with nonprofits like Cambridge is doing. Otherwise, we open the floodgates to losing really valuable assets. Is that the ringy bell? Um, hmm. Okay. That was interesting. Anyway, um, I think this is something that could easily wait a year to have more thought and to uh, hone in on could we work? I mean, Rudy's group does great work. If this said we were going to work with HAP, I'd vote for it. It doesn't say that. And it, if it said we we're going to have um, 75% affordable housing and 25% and, and, and of it would be 50% of the median. I'd vote for it. It doesn't say this. This is using the affordable housing label to, to perhaps create... I mean, it, Please don't get into motives. Just I, talk about the pros. Just talk about the pros and cons of the issue. I think that you cannot assume that the that the name affordable housing is automatically creating the best vehicle for creating affordable housing. I 100% want affordable housing. I can't support this. Um, Ms. Kruger. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the previous speaker said if um, a particular nonprofit had been named, she would support it. Actually, that would be a violation of public bidding laws. We cannot identify. I think um, my understanding of this article and the work that the trust is doing right now is to create a broad envelope. We don't know the cost. Of, we don't even know if it's feasible. We don't know the cost. Every site, every project is different and bears different parameters. We don't know if there'd be anyone interested in being the developer at this point. So it's trying to create a broad envelope, and then as more details are known, there's a public participation process to say, hey, if it's financially feasible, we'd like 50% affordable or whatever. And we've negotiated that quite uh, well with some of the recent affordable housing um, developments that we've done. So we're quite capable of negotiating for what meets the town's housing needs the best. But this is creating a broad envelope because we don't really know what we'll find and what how the details will shake out on this particular um, development. Um, yes, right on the aisle there, five rows back, four rows back. Uh, Lewis Maines of Precinct 10. A gentleman made an eloquent plea for the ghost of education that resides in this building and returning it to education. Does someone involved in having authority over education in Amherst, can they speak to whether they would in fact like to have a shot at this building? Thank you. Further discussion? Um, 
Yes, red right in the aisle there, green card. I'll stay seated. Bruce Colden, Precinct 3. All I would observe is that the motion is to move the uh, property to the, from the control of the school committee to the select board. Then the town makes a decision about what happens to it. Earlier speakers who've referred to transferring this to for-profit developers, I think, cannot presume that this article will affect that. Thank you. Um, yeah, fifth row back right there. Hi, Lisa Berry, Precinct 2. I move to call the question. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then come to an immediate vote on Article 27, which in turn also requires two-thirds. All those in favor of the motion of the previous question, please say aye. aye. No, please say no. no. Um, moderator does not hear two-thirds. We continue with the discussion. Um, yes, in the third row back in the center there with the white card. Jennifer Page, Precinct 8. I'm, I'm confused about the sequence of events. Um, I believe Mr. Hornick said that this would be presented to or requested of the school committee in June, and yet we're being asked to vote on it today. Um, it, it, I, I guess I don't understand. If we vote to approve it, and then we hear in June that the school committee actually would like to use it for educational purposes, what happens then? Or can they even say that in June if, we've already, if we already approve it tonight? I, I, I don't understand. Yes, Mr. Hornick. As I said, there are, at almost every step, something could stop this project. Could essentially say to the housing trust, no, it doesn't make sense to move it ahead. So you vote for it today, it doesn't mean absolutely it's going to move ahead. If the school committee says, we think this is a terrible idea, we don't want to concede the property at this point in time, that would probably stop it. Um, if we learn when we have architects come in that uh, it's impossible to reuse the school building, I won't say that will stop it, but it's an issue that will have to come before the Historical condition, Commission. They can stop it. Um, as I said, there are various opportunities for public input, various places where it can get stopped. Um, and as the Housing Trust recognizes, that's all possible. Nonetheless, we think that there isn't a lot of property to develop in Amherst, and we think if this is going to turn out to be a good opportunity, and I've said we don't know, then we would be foolish not to proceed with this. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, yeah, third row from the back with the green card. Hi, Bonnie McCracken, Precinct 6, and I, I also have a fondness of this building, um, not just because of historic, but my daughter also attended school. But I, I'm feeling very comfortable with this project because I've seen what Soldier On has done in several communities, and they've done a wonderful job in restoring some old buildings, school buildings, actually school buildings, into affordable housing for our veterans. Uh, one is in Willimancet in Chicopee uh, at the X. Uh, I think that was recently opened like a year ago. I encourage you to drive down there. It's beautiful, has a nice park across the street. Easy access to 91. And then there's another one in Agawam, um, also developed by Soldier On. And I'm not promoting Soldier On, but they do have a history of developing old schools into affordable housing. Um, so I encourage everybody that we, we need to move forward in getting more affordable housing in town. And this is an issue I've been working on for, for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, right here, fourth row. Kay Moran, Precinct 4. Um, I just have a question. I'm not sure there's anybody can answer it at this point, but this is being conveyed to the select board. 
And if all of these steps are not taken by December 3rd, the select board will be no more. So there will have to be, at some future time, a rewording of this, because who would, who would take possession of it at that point? Mr. Hornick. Um, as Mr. Slaughter mentioned in his introduction to this, um, this is one of the issues where there's some ambiguity about whether to proceed or not. Um, as I understand it, and certainly as the resolution uh, reads, no final decision can be made until after town council is seated and they vote on this. As I mentioned, um, from my point of view, one of the last steps is to ask town council to approve the re request for proposals, anticipating that there would be a contract that would promise the successful bidder that the property would be turned over to them at such time as they met all the contractual requirements. So I, I hope that answers the question of the speaker. Thank you. Um, yes, in the second row right there, the white card. Hi, um, Marla Jemate from Precinct 7. Um, just a question, why is the minimal um, amount of affordable housing in this article set at 25% and would it be a possible to um, introduce an amendment tonight to raise that um, threshold, for example, to 50%, uh, given that this was a building that um, had a history of public use, um, that there is a, a dire need for more affordable housing in Amherst, given that recent developments have proceeded with, with no affordable units. Um, would it make sense to raise that, that figure, and um, is there anything to prohibit us from doing that tonight? Thank you. Um. I'll answer the first part of that. I, if there was a motion to increase that amount to a higher percentage, I would rule it out of scope. Mr. Harnick, do you have anything to add? Or? Um, no, I think, to be honest, this was drafted on our behalf by the town attorneys. They argued for a kind of more conservative approach to say, okay, the minimum standard would be 25% affordable and that the minimum standard would be 80% of area median income for residents. Um, as Ms. Kruger suggested earlier, we do think we can and should do better. Further discussion? Um, yeah, red card way in the back there. Huayling Greeny, Precinct 10. Uh, I really, really appreciate the work done by Mr. Hornick and uh, the Committee for the Amherst Housing Trust. And I really want to support affordable housing. From the work that I do, I know that this town is so short of housing, not just housing for people who experience 80% income, um, area median income, but a greater shortage for people who are at the income level of 30% AMI, 15% of AMI, 7% of AMI which breaks down to about, if you are getting $700, which is the average of people who receive social security disability income. And in the 2013 housing production plan, I recall the shortage to meet people in this 30% AMI or lower and people who experience homelessness and have been evicted from their rental units, just to meet those folks the minimum required units are 40 units per year. So our goal was to produce that 40 units per year for five year period in order to reach 200 units. So this idea of getting, you know, 25% uh, to meet people who enjoy a 80% AMI, it's really a luxury. So I'm here wanting to support affordable housing, but I want to stand to support affordable housing for those who have been really excluded in our usual conversation of affordable housing for those who are, say, for the affordable housing, for the AMI 80% for one-person household, 
which is about $45,000. So I want to say that we can do better. Let's think about housing for those who are getting an income of $750 a month at $9,000 a year. Their housing needs has not been met, and many of them are forced to pay almost every dime comes into their social security check to just to have a roof over their head. So with such shortage of housing for folks in that income bracket, I think our town will show its compassion, its reverence for the idea that housing is a basic human rights, not just a human needs, but it's also a human right issue here. So I want to urge that we go back to the drawing board, continue to strive to create housing with public land that will benefit people in the lowest totem pole, such as the people that I described. So I want to second one of the previous speakers that let's make this a 100% affordable housing for people who are in the 15%, 30% AMI period. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, yes, in the back corner there. Uh, Vince O'Connor, um, Precinct 1. So my recollection is that of the town properties that have been transferred uh, for the purpose of affordable housing, um, the, the three that I can think of, and, of I'm, and I'm making the statement as a question in effect because I, I, I think there are others, but I can't recall them. There were a couple of... Uh, uh, building lots at Charles Lane that the that the developer had to turn over to the town and and that was they were done by habitat the town transferred a water fund parcel on West Pomeroy Lane to habitat for affordable housing and then the Olympia Oaks uh, project was done on town land that um, uh, we I, I think it was a tax title purchase, and um, and all, my understanding is all those units are affordable and at different levels. So I can't recall any town property. I can recall lots of projects that were various degrees of affordability. I think 30% for the co-housing community at Cherry Hill, which which they did themselves. But I can't recall any town property being... Um, used for 25%. If somebody, somebody knows of one, I'd be happy to hear it. The other question I have is, because the, the, the recreation area um, is not buildable, how many housing units could be constructed on the front part of the parcel? Um, and, and therefore, it might put the 25% in some context. What I'm concerned about I guess in asking that question is that we might have a couple of low-income families and then the other units would be along with the, the Beacon Coles project and so forth be rented out to UMass students and I don't think that's an appropriate use for town property so I I'd just like to, to know if there are other properties that of the town that have been used for affordable housing um, in a different way than uh, fully affordable, um, and what the number of units uh, that might be constructed on this property given the unbuildability of the thing. So we have some sense of what the 25% 25, 25 of what are we talking about? Mr. Slaughter. So to the last question about the, the uh, number of buildable units, I think that's, that's one of those you know, important questions and part of the due diligence that's, that's in the immediate future for the trust in looking at this piece of property. I think it's unknown at this time how many units could fit in there. It depends on what kind of housing, um, you know, depending on, you know, size of apartments or size of units that you build. Are they three bedroom only? Or are they two bedroom? Are they one? How many you can fit? That's part and parcel of the, you know, continuing investigation that's going on and will be going on. I think the other points about uh, that a lot of people have made relative to, um, you know, what level of affordability it should be and how many units of affordability there should be within this are also completely under our control and therefore will be taking uh, in 
as we get feedback from the public about how we proceed on this. And so this, I think these set sort of minimum standards, but it also, it, you know, we're certainly hearing tonight from, from the folks uh, as they get up and speak that they would like a greater level of affordability and a, and a greater number of affordable units within that. And so I think that this sets a minimum standard, but I think that there are opportunities for the public to engage and provide input and, and, and uh, guidance to the trust as well as the select board and subsequently the town council about how we proceed on this project. Thank you. Um, the woman in the front row with a white card. Denise Barber at Precinct 9. I had two questions, but now I'm down to half a question. Um, I'd like to refer back to um, a building that a previous speaker talked about in Chicopee, uh, a school building that I believe is now single residence occupancy, 100% for veterans. Um, it's a beautiful building now. I've watched it for the last seven years go from a boarded up, very decrepit looking building to now a very vital, look, vibrant looking, beautiful red brick building. Uh, and it clearly was a school before. Um, and again, it's 100% affordable uh, for veterans. Um, it seems like the efforts we've been making in the past to get more affordable housing in Amherst at best have been fairly anemic. So I guess my question is, if Chicopee can do a project like this, why can't Amherst? Um, green card in the center of there. Jerry Weiss, Precinct 8. I have a green card up, so I'm in favor of this. Um, I just want to uh, answer a couple of questions. The uh, select board is in charge of a lot of things that are going to be switched over. The new government, the, the charter takes care of all that. Anything that's not specifically named in the charter goes to the select board. There, if no. we couldn't vote on anything that is assigned to the select board, we'd be in trouble tonight. Um, second, 80% of the area median, median income is a need in this town. It's, um, the, the area median e income is, I believe, 67,500. I, I might be off, but I think that's what it is. So 80% is basically workforce housing. We need all kinds of housing, 30, 50, 80, 100 we need too. I, I, I'm a little grieved to hear people arguing about who needs it, who has the greatest need, and this is one of them, and I support any kind of affordable housing. 80% is one of them that we need in this town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right on the aisle here. Hilda Greenbaum, Precinct 1, I move to refer this back to the uh, Select Board and the Housing Trust to come up with um, plans that are, are less amorphous and that when they have a better pro proposal to bring it back to us. My big issue is... Hang on a second. Is there a second? Okay. You may now speak to your motion. Yes. And my... my this, I think they don't have enough really solid plans in this year. It's too amorphous, and I think they should study it some more, find out what is feasible, and come back to whatever body has the power. Maybe it's us in the fall. I would like to be able to vote for it. My issue on the three or four 40Bs that I worked on in the CBA is that we're only allowed... 70% is the maximum local preference you can get on the very first lottery. After the first lottery, any vacancies go to the next people on the waiting list. To me, what this turns out to be is that people who live and work in Amherst still do not have a place to live because we don't have enough units because we have to give to anybody who happens to be on the waiting list, who may or may not be originally from here, but would like to be from here. So uh, in the best of all possible worlds, for me, I'd like 100% local preference, 100% affordable, f in perpetuity. Um, so to make a long story short, come back to us with more information when you know more about what can happen to this building. I think it's a tremendous idea, but 
I'm not ready to vote for it. And, I, and the reason I'm referring it back is because I don't think you have enough votes here to pass it two thirds. And what's now before us is a motion to refer back to the select board and the housing trust. Further discussion? Um, yeah, red card way there in the corner. Thank you. Catherine Oppie, Precinct 9. Um, you know, this body has talked about affordable housing for a very, very long time. And um, I see this original article to, as a, as the Mr. Hornick and the select board have described as an overview and a beginning to get us to a place where we can provide more affordable housing in town. And I, I fear that we are making perfect uh, the enemy of the good. This is a good move forward to provide Amherst with more affordable housing. And I'm not sure why the argument is that it has to be perfect before this body will vote for it. Further discussion? Um, yes, right there in the center. Meg Gage, Precinct 1, very briefly. My understanding is that we can't get some of these answers until we make this initial approval, that it simply allows the housing authority to go forward and explore what some of the different options are and that to refer it isn't going to move the project forward because those questions haven't been answered. And I see a green card three rows from the back right there. Uh, Dorothy Pam, um, District uh, Precinct 10. Uh, I am in favor of the motion to refer it to study. I think that <clears throat> when you use public property, and public land, then the goods have to go to the public completely. And I think that means nonprofit all the way, and I think it means making those changes that people have recommended in terms of lowering the required income. Thank you. Um, yes, against the wall over there. Jim Oldham, Precinct uh, 5. I, I'm opposing referral and, and feel I can support this article. Uh, we do need affordable housing. I do support the many things that people have said here. This is public property. Uh, it should be used for, for public good. We should not, we should be very cautious as this goes forward about uh, who we partner with. We should be very cautious about delivering the, the absolute greatest affordability, number of units and, and greatest affordability. Looking at the SRO option should, should definitely be considered. Uh, whether we refer this back or vote it through now, those decisions are going to happen under a new regime. And this body, frankly, is not going to get another choice at that. So we can either we, we are having our say tonight, and we can either support a first step toward affordable housing, which is, as I understand it, simply passing it out of the school control and into the select board control. And, and even that, uh, Mr. Hornick says, might, might slip back <laughs> if, if the school committee were to object, which I don't think they will. Uh, so it's a first step. I hope what has been said to here tonight will be heard. I hope those who want to advocate for, for the strongest and best affordable housing, affordable use of this site uh, will continue to speak up. But, but I see no benefit uh, to those, no way of advancing those goals by referring this back. I see the best way to advance the goals that, that I share for 100% affordable housing, if, if we can make it happen, or for affordable housing that, that digs deeper and, and uh, at, a, at a lower level, and for the best use of this building that, that has uh, such historic value. All of that should be encouraged, but let's, let's put it in the hands of people 
or, or move it toward and express support for the idea that, that we want to see it used for affordable housing. Right now, it's an empty school. Um, just a quick note before we go on, um, a process thing. If at some point we entertain a motion with the previous question and it passes, or if there's no more discussion on the motion to refer, I'm going to interpret that as we would vote on the motion to refer and then immediately vote on the main motion if the motion to refer fails. So if, if there is a motion with the previous question, I interpret it as the end of debate for the entire article, not just the referral portion. That's all. Um, yeah, Mr. Hornick. In case anyone was curious, I also oppose the motion to refer. Um, I am sympathetic to what everyone has said. I would like to see 100% affordable units. I would like to see not only 80% AMI, which is not a luxurious level of income, but 50 and 30% and possibly lower, if we can afford the financing. I would like to see uh, if the school building can be reused. There's any number of things that people have expressed that I think make sense and we should work on. On the other hand, if you refer, it really makes it much more difficult for us to work on those issues, to work on those problems. We cannot guarantee anything at this point in time. Um, and as I've stated a number of times, there are multiple future opportunities for public input with the process that I've described. So I hope you will not refer this, but instead support our moving forward. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, yeah, I see a hand in the third row there. Chris Riddle, Precinct 2, I move the previous question. Second. Most of the previous question has been made and seconded. If two thirds of you agree, we will come to an immediate end to discussion and an immediate vote. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's two thirds. We are now coming to a vote on the motion to refer. If a majority vote in favor, then this motion, then this article has been referred and we are done with it. If it does not get a majority, if a majority vote no, then we will go back and be voting on the main motion under Article 27. Everybody with me there? I hear a point of order. No, the motion to refer requires a majority. Original was two thirds. Right, but we're not there yet. Okay. I didn't want to mention it, confuse people. Um, all those in favor of the motion to refer Article 27 to the Select Board and the Housing Trust, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. The no's have it. We are now voting on the main motion for Article 27, which does require two-thirds vote. All those in, I hear a point of order. Uh, aren't we opening this back up for discussion? No, we are not. What I explained before I entertained the previous question motion is that I would not, that I was gonna interpret the previous question as both referral and the main motion. And I thought I said that pretty clearly. And most people are kind of moving their heads that way. Sorry. Yeah. Wait, hang on. Your microphone's not on. But that's okay. Okay. So we are now coming to a vote on the main motion under Article 27, which requires two-thirds for passage. All those in favor of the motion under Article 27, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's two-thirds. We'll have an electronic vote. The results are 145 yes, 27 no, and the motion has passed by two thirds.
Yes, good. Yeah, we're hoping, we're hoping to get you a seat at the table. I am now calling on Carol Gray. I hear a point of order. Wait for a microphone, please. Gordon Freed, Precinct 6, would you please remind the body that they should not be wearing political um, announcements on themselves on the floor of the um, town meeting? Yes, if anybody is, it's clearly because they accidentally forgot. So yes, there's need, there can be no political shirts, buttons, anything like that on the floor of town meeting. Now I call on Ms. Gray to make a motion. Carol Gray, Precinct 7. I move for reconsideration of Article 8, the elementary school budget. Do I hear a second? Motion's been made and seconded for the reconsideration of the vote on Article 8, elementary school. You may speak to your motion. I am reconsidering this budget to give us the opportunity to hear a lot of information that's been collected since we voted on that budget regarding the preschool, uh, the demand for preschool slots, uh, the possibilities for location. Here's the new information. Excuse me, I hear a point of order. I'm not sure where it came from. If you could stand up, it really helps the microphone people and me. Kevin Collins, Precinct 5, are this, is the sponsor of the uh, article present? Is that the school committee? They are um, not the sponsor. I don't, I don't, I'm, that's my, I'm the one who answers that. It's the finance committee who actually brings the budget articles, and they are present, but I don't think that would necessarily make it out of order anyway. But it's the finance committee who are the formal sponsors of this article. You may continue. Uh, for, uh, for what it's worth, I did go to the school committee meeting yesterday and I gave them a 16-page memorandum with all this information. Um, so uh, here's new information. Um, after uh, the superintendent presented and, and said, as far as he knew, the children in the existing preschool at the high school have been referred elsewhere, I just made a couple calls to try to figure out, well, is there a demand? And I had no idea that I was gonna do reconsideration, I just wanted to find out more information. What I found out was that the Crocker Farm Elementary School has 31 children on their wait list for the fall. I found out that the Head Start program, their preschool has 15 children on the wait list for the fall. I found out at the school committee meeting last night that um, they've made a change to the Crocker Farm uh, preschool program, just it's going into effect this fall. And the change is to create more special ed slots, which has meant that there's a decrease in the number of regular slots. The decrease is from 40 to 32. There's more of a need for preschool. Oh, and then let's not forget the huge category, which is kids who don't have any money to go to preschool. Uh, after the discussion of, of the school budget, I spoke to Mr. Morris and I said, how many, and I was frankly shocked to hear in the enrollment working group that there were a large number of kids in our town who don't get preschool just because they're poor. So I spoke to Mr. Morris, I said, how many kids do you estimate don't go to preschool at all in our town because they can't afford it? He says, maybe 15. Um, I said, how much would it cost to get those kids into preschool? He said, maybe 120,000. Um, so that got me thinking I should do more homework. So um, since then, I also talked to the assistant at uh, the Head Start program, and I said, what do you think about the estimate of 15 kids who are low income and don't go to school? She says, I think it's very low. She says, it could, I would estimate that more than half of the eligible kids in Amherst 
don't go to preschool because they can't afford it. That's huge. Um, here's new information. Um, so I was trying to think, well, okay, you've got, even if you've got, even if we appropriate the money, you've got the space problem. Because Summit Academy, if you recall, is moving into the high school. So where else could the students go? So I emailed Mr. Morris. I said, what about other schools? He said, Wildwood is, is pretty full, high school full, Crocker Farm full. That still leaves maybe Fort River. It still leaves maybe the middle school. But then I thought, what about uh, where Summit Academy is vacating? So I... I made a call to the um, person who's the facilities person to see, um, is there anything planned for that building? As far as he knows, no, nothing planned for the fall. He said, but you don't know if the use would, would be the same. And he says, so I said, so I should call the building inspector. So I called the building inspector. And the building inspector said, as long as the kids were not younger than two years and nine months old, it would be the same use, educational use, educational use. Um, and he also said that as long as that building is in continuous use as educational purposes, then you don't, it's grandfathered in. So even though this building could certainly use work, it could be brought up to code in various ways, it's been, but it's been functioning as a school, fine, for decades. You don't have to bring everything up to code unless you have a gap in use. So keeping a preschool in that building this fall actually keeps the options open for our town in ways that having one gap year will foreclose all options for educational use unless you sink a lot of money into bringing it all up to code. Um, okay, uh, ooh, I better hurry. Um, so I already covered this. Preschool will be the same use. Uh, in fact, it used to be a kindergarten. It's still got little tiny toilets. It's still got, um, here's the classrooms, ample classrooms, nice cafeteria for 20 kids. Um, it's got a greenhouse. I went there with the teacher. The current preschool teacher is willing to continue with this program. I talked to two of the parents. They want to keep their kids in the program. They said other parents in the program also want to keep their kids in the program. One parent said, I know 30 kids who would want to be in a program. They need slots. The current teacher is outstanding. And right now, she's still available. And she went and toured this facility and said, yeah. That she was all excited. Look at, the, look at the little tiny toilets. Look at the little tiny counters, the little tiny water phone. Look at the greenhouse. This would be great. My kids are growing chives. Um, uh, I'm out of time. Please vote to reconsider. Please give us the chance to have the discussion with the school committee, with other stakeholders. Vote yes on reconsideration and hear more. Motion to reconsider requires a majority. Um, it cannot be made by somebody who voted with the minority, and Ms. Gray was absent at the last vote, so she therefore didn't vote with the minority, therefore she meets our bylaw requirements. If the motion to reconsider passes, we would find us, ourselves exactly where we were when we, just before our final vote on the elementary school budget. You may not recall, but we had two numbers before us. We had the original finance committee number of 23,227,365, and we had another number based on a motion to amend by Ms. Gray, which was 15,000 higher than that. So that's where we would be if the motion to reconsider passes. Any questions on process? Good. Um, I see a hand in the back corner there. Yes, Catherine Oppie, Precinct 9. Um, the speaker uh, suggested that the fact that there are uh, children, low-income children who need preschool as new information. I want to remind this body that I myself spoke to this body a year ago, two years ago, talking about the need for preschool seats for low-income children because Amherst did not have enough seats. So that is certainly not new information. Um, I might also point out that the building that uh, Ms. Gray is talking about, the Summit building, uh, needs a new roof. It needs a new boiler. It's got a problem with the wall. There is one small toilet. Um, and I might also add that the high school preschool program currently has 12 students in it, seven full time five part-time. The vast majority of those students are actually going to kindergarten next year. So that leaves, I believe, four children without preschool slots. But I think the, the key piece here is that um, there is not... I'm sorry, I have to interrupt for a point of order. 
Um, please stand and wait for the microphone. Maria Kapicki, Precinct 8. I'm confused about uh, procedurally. Are we discussing now, or are we talking about the, whether to reconsider? Okay, it's a, fair, it's a fair question. I let the original maker of the motion speak in favor of the motion for reconsidering by getting into specific details about preschool and the schools. Therefore, I think it's only fair. You know, maybe I should have not let that, but I did. So I think it's only fair to keep the discussion at that level and to not restrict it more now. So I, I considered that, but I did not rule the speaker out of order. And you may continue and maybe Thank set you. her clock back a couple of seconds. Thank you. Um, so my, uh, uh, the only other point I wanted to make is that if you reopen the budget and if you vote to have this money uh, potentially used for this uh, proposal, um, that is a one-time amount of money. And um, so perhaps, I don't actually think it would be enough to open a preschool at this site, given the cost of, that I've described in equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also only for one year. And um, so I think you're potentially uh, locking uh, a very, very tight, in fact, uh, both the Amherst Elementary School and the Regional School uh, budgets, as you well know, are suffering cuts and will probably do so next year as well. So I um, am not I, I'm not going to vote to um, have Article 8 reconsidered. A and just again a reminder, there is no new information. Thank you. Um, just one other quick process thing. Just a reminder that if the motion to reconsider passes and we're back in the budget, town meeting is not voting on adding a new program to the schools. Town meeting is voting on the bottom line budget. The superintendent, the school committee choose what to do with those funds. Town meeting can't decide what to do with the funds that it allocates. Um, yes, right there, second row. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Christopher Hoffman, Precinct 7. Uh, I'm going to vote against this um, uh, motion to reconsider, as I voted against every motion to reconsider that has come up in the decade or so that I've been in town meeting, including motions where the reconsideration may have overturned a decision I disagreed with. Um, the previous moderator, Mr. Gregg, used to have a little speech, which he'd often give when a motion to reconsider uh, came up. And I don't remember the details, I don't remember too much, but I do remember that he would talk about the potential for abuse that, uh, and I don't want to declare that this is, I mean, the possibility that it could cause all sorts of problems if it's not used for what it had traditionally been used for in town meeting, Amherst town meeting, which is essentially emergency situations. The hurricane had come since we voted. So I hear a point of order, so I'm interrupting the speaker. Yes, what's your point of order? There was just a reference to abuse of procedure, and, and I think a motion for reconsideration isn't actually the standard okay. that he laid out. Okay. Um, I was listening very careful, carefully to the speaker, and I did not feel that he was referencing this particular motion to reconsider. He was talking in general about something the previous moderator said that I considered repeating tonight, but didn't. And he was not talking about a specific motion to reconsider, but generally, the power and the potential abuse of any motion to reconsider. The speaker was not out of order, and you may continue. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I was hoping I would not slip and say abuse. I did not want to apply that. But what, the parliamentary problems with reconsideration, um, for instance, he pointed out that the uh, US Congress, after every vote, they have a pro forma reconsideration to ensure that an actual reconsideration will ever happen. Also, I noticed that uh, the town meeting, um, we're based on modified Robert's Rules of Orders. Robert's Rules of Orders, uh, actually, um, motions for consideration can only be made by people who voted with the majority, not just people who are absent, as we allow in Amherst town meeting. But I mean, partly, I mean, town meeting, we only have a few more days. You know, if we're going to set a new precedent for town meeting and, and interpret this, you know, you know it's okay. I, I'm, 
I'll live with it. But I, you know, I do want to consider. We have zoning articles coming up. Some of them are controversial, or may be controversial. There may be some close decisions. Do we really want to start a policy in these last few days that uh, any decision we make might be brought up at any other time when people who may not know it be expecting it and want to talk about it, who may want to vote, are not here? Um, again, the moderator, previous moderator, you know, new information was not information that you didn't think about before the article came up, that you didn't you know, redo research beforehand. New information was not information that you were waiting to be uh, recognized, but you weren't recognized and you didn't get to present. Well, you could have done the back table, you could have you know, sent death to the email list. New information was literally new information that could not have been known at the time we took the vote. And this did not appear to be that, as the previous speaker has said. So for all those reasons, I'm encouraging people to quickly dismiss this article, this, this motion to reconsider, and let's get back to the actual articles we have not decided yet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Tomlin. The Finance Committee voted 601 to urge you not to reconsider. Um, we believe that since the school committee did not present this in their budget, that is, an expansion of its academic preschool program was not presented in its budget, uh, it is not on their wish list, and there is no plan for it at the present time. We believe this proposal should come from the Amherst School Committee and, and not a town meeting member. Thank you. Um, yeah, I see a green card third from the back there. Um, Dorothy Pam, Precinct 10. Preschool is one of the most important things in terms of dealing with income inequality. I just want to remind people that it is worth everything that you spend and it makes the greatest difference in people's lives and their chance to move ahead in the society in a meaningful way. Um, yes, second row there, the gentleman, yes. John DeRusso, Precinct 5. Uh, I think one of the things that really strikes me when we're talking about this is that we debated $180,000 on signs for the center of town, essentially for students and their parents, which is not really necessary, and yet somehow we're sitting here talking about whether or not it's really worth it to consider preschool for children. Um, as the previous speaker said, preschool is one of the most important things to determine what goes forward and how successful people are in their future education. It, it doesn't seem that this is a huge risk for the town to consider maybe reopening this budget and reconsidering what we're really dealing with for the bottom line, when the reality is that these are kids' lives uh, and this is their future that we're kind of debating. And to give our schools the flexibility to go forward and, and reconsider maybe giving some preschool seats back, it, it seems like a small cost, honestly, in hindsight, when you compare things like signs uh, in preschool. So just kind of to, to get that perspective. Yeah, I hear a point of order. I heard a point of order. Sharon Povinelli, Precinct 1. I believe the previous speaker referred to $180,000 in a budget when it was $90,000 for the wayfaring signs. Um, that's, that's not really a point. When somebody says something that you think may not be true, that's not a point of order. You can, you can raise your hand and look to rebut them, but it's not a point of order. Plenty of people say things that aren't true all the time. Yes, second row from the back with the red card. Um, microphone? Hang on, um, can you check it to see if it might have been turned off accidentally? Hold on, other microphone is coming. Susan Tracy, Precinct 6. Um, I wanted to remind us that we are no longer in the 
actual original town meeting. We're actually in a transitional town meeting. And um, we are taking care to set up next year's budget and other institutions as thoughtfully as we can for another form of government. And I think we've done a pretty good job with pretty good spirit so far. I find this reconsideration mo uh, um, motion completely um, antithetical to that spirit. And I would remind you again that Joel Bard in his April 17th letter said to us that we ask ourselves as we deliberate any matter we are considering, will it take some time to accomplish, leaving opportunity for the town council to weigh in at a critical juncture, or is this something that requires immediate action and cannot be delayed, in which case we need to act on it right away. This is not one of those actions that we need to act on right away. In fact, it begs for additional study, for additional public input, for the town council to come in on it. This is, com and I think for that reason, I would not support this motion. And I urge you to join me in voting against this motion. Um, yeah, green card there, second row from the back. Hi, uh, Kenton Thar, Precinct 1. And I believe we are in a regular town meeting. I don't call this a transitional town meeting. I've been a town meeting member for maybe 30 years, and I don't believe there's any guidelines that make a reconsideration vote an okay vote or not an okay vote. I think it's part of what we have is the power of town meeting to present things that uh, become very important. And this is something that's very important. Town, um, preschool is a necessary um, uh, transition into life. And those of us that can afford to send our children to preschool know that. And those that can't afford to do also know that, but they don't get the chance. And this is a chance to provide more preschool for more children, some of which would not have that opportunity otherwise. And almost any study you look at shows the importance of preschool. And having observed uh, preschool for almost 30 years that my wife ran, my late wife ran, and that I participated in some, I have seen the immense joy, the immense change, the amazing uh, coming to an, a transcending understanding of people and children and that can carry them through the rest of their life in terms of creating a more peaceful world because they've learned that people in you know, the preschool may, may have differences, maybe of a different race or a different economic place. But this is a life-changing experience that we you know, need for our children. And probably a lot of us here have been able to do that. But a lot of people don't have that opportunity. And there's plenty of people out there looking for a preschool. And we happen to have, at least for another year, somebody who's a good preschool teacher, who's uh, still available, and a place that hopefully will it begin to understand somehow that we need this in every one of our budgets. You know, just because it's, you know, might be a year, we need not to present a budget that doesn't have it in because it's such an important aspect of the lives of our children. Thank you. Okay. To reconsider this, thank you. Um, right there in white shirt holding the red card. I'm Steve Schreiber, Precinct 9, and I made a quip earlier that if we pass this and the next um, motion to, the, the anticipated motion, then we'll be well on our way to our first net zero building because I think we're talking about millions of dollars, not um, $100,000. I think the presenter was offering an opinion that are really within the scope of architecture that, um, to my knowledge, no architects have been have been consulted as to whether or not this project is shovel ready. 
that can actually be moved into. In other words, we heard stories about bathrooms and sort of its past history, but it's a change of occupancy from, from one use to another, and I doubt very seriously that it could be simply moved into. I think that if we approve this motion to reconsider and then the next motion, we will be entering a rabbit hole and in basically into a brand new, very expensive capital project. Yes, front corner right here. Thank you for letting me respond to a couple things. Identify yourself, please. Oh, Carol Gray, Precinct 7. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is, you could put the overhead on, please. Well, I shouldn't have highlighted in orange. Basically, this shows that in the capital budget, there's 50,000 designated for this building that's left over. It's carried forward to this new year. Also, um, if we get to reconsideration, I have more information to share with you, such as that I, this building is historic. It's, I found a postcard from 1910. It would certainly qualify for CPA funding. East Hampton got a brand new boiler for, with CPA funds. The Jones Library got uh, funding from CPA for the slate roof. Uh, Summit Academy has been there for, I think, four decades. The roof does need to be worked on, and the boiler does need to be replaced at some point, but they're still there. They're, they're there yesterday, they're there tomorrow, and this school could be there, the preschool could be there in the fall. Um, I actually talked to the, I've talked to the teacher numerous times. She's been out to look at, the preschool teacher's been out to look at this building, the Summit Academy building, um, and uh, it's actually not most of the kids are going to kindergarten. It's um, about maybe half the kids out of 12. But she also says, I keep getting more calls. Every day I get more calls of kids who need spots. Um, the other thing is the amount re being requested, even though uh, Mr. Morris had said 120, I was actually going to come in at a lower amount. I was talking to Russ Vernon Jones. It's in the next presentation if you let us get to reconsideration. There's a budget that lays out. Uh, I think this could be um, 86,000 with 10 free slots. And, and it would be completely sustainable if you get eight kids paying the full, full tuition, 10,000. This can, this can work, and it can work this fall. The other thing is, this opens the conversation. We can't mandate that the school committee do this or, or that the superintendent consider it, but if we don't allow the money, there's no chance. If we allow the money, there's a chance to have a conversation and a chance to explore whether we can get 10 kids who have no ability to go to preschool in that school. And also, could we have it be a sustainable model? Um, the, the, Mr. Morris had said uh, part of the funding would need to be for busing. 25000 of that 86000 would be for, for um, a little minivan. Um, I have the whole budget. If you let us get to reconsideration, Russ Vernon Jones, who couldn't be here right now because of another meeting, gave a proposed budget that he thinks can work fine. It's $86,000. Um, the, uh, um, by the way, the wayfinding signs were 90,000, this is 86,000. And I found in the JCPC uh, budget, there's 20,000 left over from last year for wayfinding signs that wasn't used. In any event, um, let's get to reconsideration because there's still more information to share and there's more people that have information, but we're not at reconsideration yet. I hope you'll let this information come out. It's, it's so important. You know, it's a $92 million budget and this is 86,000. Let's get to the next step and hear more information. I hear a point of order. Wait for the microphone, please. Jennifer Page, Precinct 8. Mr. Moderator, since Ms. Gray is the petitioner, shouldn't she have the privilege of staying up front and not having to sit out here and raise a card? If she wants to sit up front, sure, although she's already spoken twice, so I'm not likely to call on her again, just because, because that's what our bylaw says I'm supposed to do. Um, if, so that's where we're at, but sure, she can sit there if she wants to. Um, yes, in the back corner right there. No, yeah, yes. Nicola Usher, Precinct 1. Um, this isn't necessarily relevant, but my daughter did actually go to the preschool at the high school. It was great. I love it. It breaks my heart to be speaking against money that may or may not go to restore it. And I think that's important to stress. This vote would put money back in the bottom line. There is no guarantee it will go towards expanding preschool. I also think that under the best of circumstances, having a preschool up and running in three months with $125,000 is unlikely, not to mention a lot of other unanswered questions and a proposal that's not brought to us 
Hang on, I hear a point of order, so I'm forced to interrupt you. Consideration, if we get to, re Carol Gray, Precinct 7, if we get to reconsideration, I'll say the amount. It's not actually 125. Okay, excuse me, Ms. Gray, that is not a point of order. If you have an argument with what somebody is saying, you have to wait to be recognized. A point of order is a very powerful and tool that is easy to abuse because you're interrupting a speaker and interrupting their train of thought. Please be careful and be sure that your point of order has to do with procedure and not with the content of what somebody is saying. I apologize and you may continue. Thank you. Um, the school committee is seated in a town-wide election. They assess the budget in a months-long deliberative public process with input from school principals. Budget decisions are hard. When cuts are needed and funding is not infinite, tough decisions, are, tough decisions need to be made. Losing beloved programs sucks. Demo in democracy, we don't all get what we want. I'm a Wildwood parent. I would love for my child to be in a classroom with walls or have a building with secure entrance. I wish that we had accepted $34 million with the promise of expanded preschool when we were told there were kids on wait lists. Oh, sorry, am I questioning I hear motives? a point of I'm order. I'm sorry. Wait, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you because I heard a point of order. What is your point of order, sir? Rob Kessner, Precinct 3. Um, I believe the speaker is digressing from the item by bringing up things from okay. last year. Okay. Let me respond. First of all, I find that a bit insulting to me because it assumes I'm not listening. I am listening, and I will make the determination when somebody is digressing. So... That's not the kind of point of order that is, I don't know, never mind that. Um, you may continue again, my apologies. Thank you, this is becoming far less eloquent. Um, I'm sorry, emotions are running high. Again, it's what happens. It hurts to lose things we like. Um, I think there are a lot of unanswered questions that have already been raised. Um, I was curious about who the parents and community members were that signed this memo, how many were there? Is it th seven, is it 100? How much will moving the playground equipment cost? The labor for prepping the building? Somebody brought this up already, how the school will be funded in future years. Many of the children waitlisted for Crocker, Head Start, or other programs may have identified special needs. How will this school handle that pedagogically or otherwise? Um, how does the school get staffed and the teachers, teachers get support without interns from the high school? If part of the plan were to include interns from the high school, how are they getting there? And how does that impact their high school schedule if they now okay. have to travel? We're digressing a little from the thought I'm, of whether or not I'm just, to These are questions that a deliberative body with more than three months to plan a preschool would address. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, right there in the fourth row with a white card. Thank you, Jane Wald, Precinct One. Um, with some unknowns, so many unknowns about program and capital costs, um, Mr. Moderator, I wonder if you could clarify something you said uh, earlier about um, if we were, if this were to, if we were to reconsider the elementary school budget, we would go back to a condition where we would there were two numbers on the table, right? A That's higher correct. number, a lower number, a difference between them of fifteen thousand dollars. At that point, what would our options be? Would we be voting on that higher number and then the lower number? Or what, what other actions would, could be taken? My expectation is that if the motion to reconsider passes, somebody would be making a motion to amend the budget amount for a new higher amount. Because once we pass a reconsideration, it's not like we have to vote again. We are back in discussion of the articles. That's what I expect would happen. Ms. Tileman. This, this is the cost of last year's preschool at the high school. There were 12 children. They each paid $9,000 a year for $108,000.
and the regional schools had to come up with another 25,000 to support the program. So the program cost 133,000 for 10 children. Okay, I'd like to try and rein us in and get back to the question of whether or not to reconsider and not get too much into the details of a proposed project that we can't even demand happens. Um, yes, right there in the fourth row. Kay Moran, Precinct 4. Um, many people here seem to know this was going to come up for reconsideration, and some people, and I've already heard about plans for this preschool. Uh, there's no public notice about this. Um, there was no message sent to all town meeting members. So no chance for town meeting members to think about it. No chance for the public to weigh in. No public hearings. Uh, this apparently just came up, although th what's the proposer and other speakers have said, according to them, it sounds like there's been deep thought about this, some planning, some research, but no public input. I think we should vote not to reconsider this. Thank you. Pretty soon we're going to want to come to a vote, believe it or not. Um, yes, along the aisle with the green card. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Morianne Adams, Precinct 10. Uh, I urge that you vote with me for reconsideration. We've been tossing around a great deal of guesswork and uncertainty that the proposer has suggested would be the next part of the discussion if we pass the vote for reconsideration and have an opportunity for a substantive discussion. So uh, number one, I urge that we vote for reconsideration so that we can then have the discussion. The reason uh, that uh, I support the idea of reconsideration is that this would maintain continuity in a very important program that already exists. We've heard other speakers speak to how critical early childhood education is for all children, and therefore the importance of our providing the support for those who cannot afford to do so. I also remind all of us how concerned we were about the downward trajectory of school enrollment. And I think that one of the ways that we support school enrollment is maintaining early childhood education so that the children who would be moving elsewhere or unprepared for school would be able to do so once they got into the upper levels of our schools. I'm personally embarrassed that I didn't think to mention this when we were going through the school budget, but there were many other things that we were focused on. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to look at new information because I think this is one of the most important things that this body can consider. And let me just conclude by saying that with the greatest respect for people who plan the budget, which I certainly have done for 40, 50 years in my other life, I'm used to being talked back to by the legislative bodies who may indeed have thought of something that I didn't think of. So I urge for reconsideration. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you have something new to bring to the discussion, keep raising your hands. If you're just repeating something somebody else said, maybe not so much. Um, yes, on the Finance Committee there. Uh, Tim Tim Neal on the Finance Committee. I first of all apologize for the hat, but the lights are right in my eyes. Um, I'm speaking to the uh, reconsideration question. Uh, many of us have concerns about some of the previous budget votes. I mean, I could maintain, I really would have liked to have more firefighters, yet uh, there was no proposal to have that reconsidered. We have a very, very tight budget this year, and I would echo a previous speaker on that side of the, the aisle earlier that we are running into a very sticky wicket if we open up uh, considerations that we've had a long debates on in previous, uh, previous sessions. We did have a long debate on this very question, and the, this body voted to not approve the preschool program uh, previously. And I'm not at all because it's not a worthy program, but there are budget considerations, and if we open up 
each question that people just weren't happy with, it's going to be a significant problem. So I would vote and urge you all to vote against reconsideration uh, for this particular reason. Um, yes, all the way in the back with the white card. Thank you. Jeff Mazer, Precinct 3, I call the question. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. We will now come to an immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will end debate and then come to a vote on the motion to reconsider the elementary school budget. All those in favor of the motion of the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's two-thirds. We now come to a vote on the motion to reconsider the elementary school portion of Article 8. This requires a majority for passage. All those in favor of the motion to reconsider, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. no. Moderators in doubt will have an electronic vote. The vote is 76 in favor, 106 against. The motion to reconsider has failed. 76, 106. We will now have a brief five minute break, which was different than a long five minute break. <laughs> so come back in really five minutes. I now call on Mr. Schreiber to make a motion under Article 30. I move in terms of the article. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Mr. Crowner will be speaking for the planning board. Mr. Crowner. Thank you. I knew that. Rob Crowner, planning board. <clears throat> when we brought you the marijuana zoning article in the fall, it was to establish basic zoning regulations for the retail sale of marijuana products which we all knew would be definitely be coming to Amherst. At the time, the state's Cannabis Control Commission had not yet promulgated mm -hmm. general rules for marijuana businesses in Massachusetts, and we knew that we would likely be coming back to you with more marijuana zoning once they did. That happened earlier this year, and sure enough, here we are with two more articles in response to those rules, Articles 30 and 31. <clears throat> Article 30 is about um, um, medical marijuana uses. When, when medical marijuana was legalized a few years ago, the rules were that, they, that the businesses had to be nonprofit. Uh, that is no longer going to be the case. And so um, our definitions call for nonprofit businesses uh, for marijuana uses. We're just, this article just uh, removes references to nonprofit and not for profit in the definitions for medical marijuana uses. That's all it does. Thank you. And Ms. Brewer for the select board. The select board voted 4-0 with one absent on April 23rd to recommend this article. And the Finance Committee has no position. It's my understanding they don't need to speak. I guess I'm correct about that. This is a change to the zoning bylaw. It will require a two-thirds vote. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We will now come to a vote on the motion in terms of the article for Article 30. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. The ayes have it unanimously. Good speech. Good speech huh? We now move on to Article 31. Um, before we begin, I want to point out yet another Scrivener's error in the warrant article. And it's a kind of a fine point, but in section 3.363.2, in two, there were actually no changes, even though it appears in bold. 
Do I have that right? Because it looks like 363 is in bold. That's right, okay. So 3.3.363.2 has no changes. Um, and now I call on Mr. Schreiber to make a motion. I move in terms of the article. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Uh, Mr. Crowner again. Yes, Mr. Crowner. Um, Mr. Moderator, I ask for two additional minutes. Mr. Crown has requested two additional minutes for a total of seven. Without objection, you may continue. Thank you. Uh, this article is all about the different kinds of marijuana businesses that might spring up in the wake of legalization. Any new business that proposes to locate in Amherst is regulated according to its nearest fit in the zoning bylaws use chart. If we do not have an explicit entry for a particular kind of marijuana business, we may find that it gets matched to a use we didn't intend and escapes the specific conditions we expect to adhere to marijuana businesses, such as the buffer zone around certain other protected uses like residences and schools. So if we want to be in control of regulating marijuana businesses in Amherst, we need to make provisions for it in the zoning bylaw, which is what this article does. The Cannabis Control Commission defined and established regulations for eight distinct types of marijuana-related businesses, including marijuana retailer, which last fall's article made room for in the use chart. This article adopts the state's definitions for those types of businesses and assigns them to the use chart as subheadings under the marijuana uses section. Marijuana cultivator and craft marijuana cooperative would be allowed in the same zones and under the same permitting as marijuana retailers. That is to say, by special permit in the major mixed use zones, general business, limited business, village center business, and commercial, plus the office park and light industrial zones while marijuana transporter would also be allowed by special permit in the PRP zone. Independent marijuana testing laboratory and marijuana research facility would have the same permitting standards as our existing research and development and testing facility use, while marijuana product manufacturer and marijuana microbusiness would have the same permitting standards as our existing light manufacturing use. All of these would be allowed by either special permit or site plan review in all of the business zones as well as by special permit in the Village Center resident zone. In all cases, however, they would be subject to the general standards and conditions adhering to all marijuana businesses, including the buffer, which I will get to in a minute. The Cannabis Control Commission's draft regulations included three other kinds of marijuana businesses that were not in the final version, and they will not be able to receive state licenses at this time. However, we have decided to include these in our list of defined uses and in the use chart so that we are not caught short the Cannabis Control Commission does inevitably permit them. They are delivery only retailer, social consumption operation, and social consumption operator. The town's marijuana working group also identified one other marijuana business not included in the Cannabis Control Commission's draft or final regulations. That seemed prudent to include in ours, the Marijuana Social Club. We're including all of these in the use chart as not allowed in any zone for now. When the Cannabis Control Commission comes up with guidelines and regulations for those types of businesses, you can expect the planning board to take another look at those uses and possibly recommend allowing them in one or another zone in Amherst. The standards and conditions themselves, which are a part of the use chart, would be generalized to apply to all marijuana uses, where currently there are references to either medical marijuana or marijuana retailers, and otherwise cleaned up. There's one fairly significant change that I want to point out which has to do with the buffer between marijuana uses and certain protected uses. This is in sections 3E1A and 3E2 on page 20 of the warrant. The existing language calls for a 300-foot buffer, and by convention is measured essentially from building to building. The Cannabis Control Commission's regulations allowed up to a 500-foot buffer around schools from kindergarten through high school, measured from property line to property line, which is a much stricter standard. We have decided to adopt that standard for schools while leaving in place the 300-foot buffer for other kinds of protected uses. This means that the school buffer is significantly increased from what we ha currently have in place and is in fact the largest buffer that the state allows. You can see from the maps that the buffers severely restrict any kind of marijuana business from locating almost anywhere in Amherst. These maps are not definitive and they are not regulatory. They're merely an attempt to illustrate how the buffer works to guide where a marijuana business can or cannot operate. Any proposal to open a marijuana business in Amherst 
will have to include a more precise measurement of the actual boundaries of those buffers. So what happens if you do not approve this article? I think the major implications are these. First, it would not prevent one of these businesses from locating in Amherst because there is a close enough match for most of them already in the use chart. Next, a marijuana cultivation facility could attempt to locate in an area that we don't expect or don't want. We do not necessarily object to cultivation facilities on farms, but we haven't come up with the right regulations to keep them out of strictly residential areas where our farms are all located. We're working on that and we'll have something eventually. Next, a marijuana social club or a marijuana delivery service, currently not allowed, could apply to locate in Amherst as soon as the Cannabis Control Commission allows them, but before we are ready to regulate them. And there would be a smaller buffer around schools. Finally, I should note that this article incorporates Article 32, which clarifies that the number of marijuana retailers is limited to eight locations throughout town. Retailers. The current language refers to eight marijuana retailers and could be interpreted to allow more than eight locations if a single retailer owned more than one shop. We will move to dismiss Article 32 if Article 31 passes. And the Planning Board uh, recommended this Article 6 to 0 with two absences, two abstaining and one absent. Thank you. Ms. Brewer for the Select Board. The Select Board voted 4-0 with one absent on April 23rd to recommend this article to you. A couple of members of the Select Board, several staff, have been working in a marijuana internal working group for over a year. We meet at least twice a month, frequently more often. We also attend hearings and professional development throughout the state. We also have Mr. Kravitz here with us tonight, who has become not what he thought he would become when he became our economic development director, but now our marijuana czar. And so he will be available to answer questions for you. We are not talking tonight about relitigating any of the marijuana question. What we are talking about is exactly what Mr. Crowner pointed out and is on page four of your planning board report, helpfully put in town meeting mailing number two. This amendment gives the building commissioner and the ZBA a set of guidelines to regulate businesses that are going to be coming here. So if you don't pass this zoning, then you will have to leave it up to the building commissioner, who you may like a lot, but that is one person, to figure that out. Not having the guidelines doesn't mean they won't come here. It means that the way they operate would become the de facto standards, and we certainly don't want to have to tailor regulations around existing businesses. There have been questions from both ends of the spectrum on these issues. Questions about, is this actually prohibition because we have large buffer zones? The answer is no, because there are still plenty of places that we believe would be appropriate for these businesses. But in regards to the buffer zones, the Regional School Committee did support this article mainly because of that 500-foot buffer zone that the state suggested and that we then adopted, which is in fact a larger buffer zone than had been in the work that you did in the fall on town meeting. Town meeting very wisely chose to establish zoning for medical marijuana way back in 2013 and for adult use recreational marijuana at special town meeting just in November. We did not choose to pursue a moratorium. We don't need a moratorium. We are ahead of the game. We are way ahead in comparison to many other communities. This will set us up for success moving forward. We will definitely have more discussion about agriculture. We know that's a huge issue in Amherst. We want to be able to have small micro grows. That is exactly the sort of thing we want to have, and we're just going to need a little more time to figure it out more carefully. Please support this article. Thank you. Finance Committee had no position on this, and this will require a two-thirds vote. It is a change to our bylaw. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? I see it. Do I see a hand or not? Okay, against the wall there. Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. I had a couple detailed questions. I was curious about the, the decision to, to, to allow some of these uses in, in village, central, village center residential. Uh, sort of just understand the thinking and what similar, what, what, what existing uses that are allowed in that area are, are comparable. 
And, and the other question was just, uh, I was trying to understand the, the map on, the map show, uh, on the high school doesn't seem to show the, the buffer going in all directions from the high school. I may, may be having trouble, trouble reading it on page, I think, nine of the, the handout that we had. Anybody care to respond? Uh, I'm sorry, it was breast strap. I can respond to the second question. Um, the uh, buffer zones that are shown around the high school are only shown in the direction um, of the zones in which any of these marijuana establishments could actually be located. If you were to go in the other directions towards Chestnut Street or um, Gray Street or any of those other residential streets, um, there would be no possibility for a marijuana establishment to uh, be located there. Thank you. Um, hang on, I hear a point of order. Is it? Yeah. Maria Kapicki, Precinct 8. A lot of folks are having trouble uh, grabbing their maps. Could you please project the maps that you're talking about? Yeah. And just so people know, we'll project it. Um, it's, it was in I don't know if it was the first mailing or the second mailing, but the front page says Planning Board Report to Town Meeting, Article 31. And it's at about six sheets stapled together. It's always fun trying to get somebody to get it right side up. Here, yeah, Ms. Breskrop, you want to talk us through the map, perhaps? So. Um, this is kind of hard because I wasn't expecting to do this, but the map um, shows the high school property outlined. Um, as you can see, there's a sign there that says high school, Emerson Regional High School. Um, the blue uh, circles are um, measured from the property line of the high school, um, and they go towards the center of town. Um, they are quite extensive, and they go, uh, it's, it, again, it's hard to point. Is there a pointer here? Not sure if there is or not, but um, towards Bertucci's, um, you can see Bertucci's is that little pink dot that's, um, yes, right there. That's Bertucci's. So Bertucci's would not be, that property, which is currently vacant, would not be allowed to be used for a marijuana establishment because its property line is contained within the blue circle there that is the 500-foot uh, proposed buffer. All the pink circles are... Um, 300-foot buffers, which would be maintained, those are already in our bylaw, and those are against properties where children commonly congregate, like churches and libraries, and um, they are also uh, against residences, so residences would not be uh, allowed to have a, a marijuana establishment within 300 feet of a residence. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, yes, on the planning board. I'll answer the, the first part of that of the previous speaker's question. Um, the the uses that would be allowed in, in village center residents are are testing and research uses. Those testing and research uses are already allowed in uh, residence village center residence uses, and we didn't think that uh, marijuana testing was any um, significantly different than other kinds of research and testing uh, kinds of uses. So we thought if they if they were able to be located in there, it would be difficult in, in a village center residence because, because you'll have residential buffers anyway. Um, but if they can locate there, um, why not have those kinds of businesses in Amherst? Thank you. Um, yes, second row there. Irene Duhovner, Precinct 3. I have a question within the, with the within 300 feet of a building, particularly with item 2 eyes regarding where children commonly congregate in an organized ongoing formal basis. How are you going to implement that on parks? For example, Mid River, um, right now it doesn't have any buffer zone associated with it. It has maybe one building that is the bathrooms way inside, but children congregate throughout, and it would affect the North Village. Um, center. So I was wondering how I'm going to be implementing this on parks where children congregate. Ms. Breskrop. I'll, 
I'll try to answer the question. I'm not sure I understood the question, but you seem to be asking about North Village Center, so I'll show a map about that. No? There, you go. there we go. Okay. So um, this map here that we have shows part of North Amherst Village Center. We didn't show all the possible locations where we might possibly uh, have marijuana establishments. There are many in town, and we focused on a, a few of them. This is North Amherst Village Center. The green areas are the areas where um, the zoning would allow um, marijuana establishments to go. The pink um, circles are showing buffer zones. So um, I'm not sure I understood exactly what uh, the, the questioner asked, but um, there is a buffer zone around the North Amherst School. There's a buffer zone around the North Amherst Library, uh, buffer zones around um, many of the residential uses. Um, Thank you. Um, you want to follow up and maybe try and explain your question a little more. Wait for the microphone. Hi, my question was uh, regarding Mill River, for example, the Mill River Park. So on the street is very narrow entrance, but there's no building associated with Mill River. Ms. Prestra. I think that Mill River um, is not close to uh, an area that would allow um, a marijuana establishment to go, and um, perhaps Mr. Crowner would be able to uh, answer this if he's recognized. Mr. Crowner. So um, the Mill River is already buffered all the way around here. You can see all, all of these. There's no place that is... Um, within 300 feet of Mill River that, that has not already been buffered. These, the uh, Riverside Apartments, these are residential uses. Those, those would also have buffers. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't show all the buffers. Um, again, if someone proposes a use in, in, the, in the Riverside Plaza here, they would have to show that it's 300 feet away from, from all the protected uses, including all the residence uses, which would, which would um, also effectively buffer the Mill River Recreation Area. Thank you. Um, yeah, the white card right there in the center. Thank you, Janet Keller, Precinct One. Um, when this uh, article is adopted and the, um, will you be mapping, you, you uh, stated that um, you haven't mapped everything yet on the buffers, but will those buffer maps be available when this is adopted, if and when this is adopted? Ms. Brestrup. So what happens um, with any use that comes into town, um, people come in and ask people in my department and the building commissioner's department, inspection services, um, they say, I would like to establish X use in this location. And then we tell them, no, you can't do that because of this, this, and this rule. Or yes, you can do that, and here's how you do it. So um, I think that may answer your question that it, it uh, occurs at the time we have great um, zoning maps on our website, and I would be happy to answer questions that anybody has, but it's usually on a case-by-case uh, -case basis that we tell people whether they can or can't do whatever it is they're proposing. Thank you. Um, yeah, in the, hang on just a second. Yes, fourth in, in the back row there. I hadn't thought about Identify this yourself. at Church Precinct 5. I hadn't thought about it before I realized how extensive these zones were. I don't know if there are any places that will be appropriate, but my question that I had is, how about um, the downtown where there are some areas that could be housing above, like restaurants and stuff like that? Is that... Is that considered a residential, or is that considered retail? Ms. Brestrup. 
buildings that have um, mixed use on the bottom, retail or commercial, and residential or above, those are considered mixed use buildings, and the buffer zones do not apply to mixed use buildings. They just apply to buildings that are completely residential. Thank you. Um, yes, third row over here. Andrew Parker, Inga, Precinct 5. Um, I'm just a little concerned that when we make it such a great, changing the language as opposed to having the wording be specific to where children commonly congregate, I mean, I think it's implied what we're talking about here, but like, I mean, grocery stores, restaurants, I mean, I know. You, you broke it. Hello, there I am. There we go. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I'm a musician as well. Drop <laughs> the mic. But um, I, I just, I, I think that we are all on the same page about the spirit of what this is going to be doing, and I certainly want to take the state's recommendations. But I'm just a little concerned that maybe somebody could just ease me. I mean, we've basically just eliminated downtown by doing this, which I have a problem with. We're removing all forms of businesses from downtown. But I understand that may make everyone else here more comfortable, but can we just, I mean, I, I, you identified the parcels last time. I don't think any of those are in jeopardy given this new law from what the information I saw. This isn't affecting anything of what we saw last time in terms of the North University Drive options that were listed, um, the ones that were listed in South Amherst. I mean, the same places that have been identified are gonna remain. I mean, is this changing anything that we had previously got from our last town meeting in terms of identified locations? Thanks. Yes, Mr. Crowner. Um, I think, so I, there are two, I heard two questions in there. One is um, about where children congregate. The wording is where children uh, congregate in an ongoing organized formal basis. So I, I don't think that would, would cover a, a grocery store. Um, and as far as, um, the places that are eligible or, or might be uh, eligible for a marijuana business, this this um, this amendment would reduce the number of places. Um, the, the Kendrick Place and Bertucci's previously probably would have been eligible to host a place. If this were adopted, they would not because of the 500 foot buffer from the school property line. Um, additionally, in East Amherst, Village Center around Southeast Street and and College Street, there are some um, some places that might have been eligible before and now would not be eligible because of the 500 foot buffer. Thank you. Further discussion. Um, yeah, over there, the th third, fourth row on the against the wall there. Yes. Laura Quilter, Precinct 9. I'm looking at um, the buffer material, um, EB, um, within 300 feet of a building. And um, um, the, the previous section says within a uh, pre-existing, let's see where I'm losing, sorry, I'm losing my place, um, in which, it, let's see, in which children commonly congregate in an organized ongoing formal basis that is not a pre that is not a K-12 school. And in the prior section, I believe it says pre-existing. And here it doesn't say pre-existing. And so now I'm pondering, how do we decide and when do we decide um, where children are commonly congregating? Like how often do we check on that? How do, and, and what if things change? For instance, Amherst Martial Arts is going to be closing um, from its downtown location because, you know, um, rents and so, you know, they're going to be moving. How are we going to be kind of assessing this on an ongoing basis? I'm assuming existing businesses will be grandfathered in, but it's not really clear. And um, what constitutes sort of the minimum number of children commonly congregating? Because there's small preschools, there's small organizations of all sorts that offer services for children. Thank you. Ms. Brestrup. So um, there, there's the notion of coming to the nuisance. So if the nuisance, if you consider a marijuana establishment as such, 
already exists, then you would choose not to put your preschool right next to it, perhaps, or maybe you would. But that would be your choice. Um, it, these rules are rules that govern the marijuana uses themselves. So if there is something that exists right now and a marijuana use wants to come within 300 feet of it, it wouldn't be allowed to do that. I think that answers the question. Um, yeah, second row from the back, the white card. Michael Lash, uh, Precinct 9. Uh, in the same area, uh, E prohibitions, B within 300 feet, I'm just curious about the logic for the 300 feet, foot buffer around other marijuana establishments. Wouldn't there be advantages to concentrating them um, and also, you know, sort of anti-question of anti-competitive practices? I'm just curious about the logic. Ms. Brestrop. I think, excuse me, I think we've heard about other um, cities and towns that have uh, legalized marijuana and um, perhaps end up with um, a strip that is entirely marijuana sales. I've never witnessed this, but I've understood that this is the case. So we were trying to avoid that, um, not to have you know every business in a strip be um, a marijuana establishment, and therefore the 300-foot buffer. Um, yes, along the aisle there. Irv Rhodes, Precinct 7. I, I might have missed this somewhere, but could you point out to me where in the boundaries in the town of Amherst an establishment of this kind would be able to be located under the current article? Ms. Prescott? I'm sorry, we don't have a map that shows where all of these things would be um, existing. We do have some illustration. Perhaps Mr. Crowner would be better to um, answer this question. Mr. Crowner. Would recognize him. So this, this, this one, you can see uh, in the green here, um, areas that, that are not, or that we think are not affected by a buffer. So there's some in North Amherst. Um, Some along University Drive, in the green there. Some along Route 9, um, just west of, of Hawkins Meadow, and, and maybe right, right up by Snell Street. Um, in the Atkins Corner Village Center, all the way around Atkins, those, those parcels appear to be eligible. Um, and up in North Amherst, um, in the light industrial zone, there's some along Russell Road or, or whatever, whatever that is. Um, Meadow Street, yeah. And, and then north of, of uh, the auction barn if you can access to it. Ms. Brestrop. So we did not do an exhaustive mapping um, exercise on this. Um, you can say that um, marijuana uses are already allowed in the business zones, the downtown business zone, the BL or limited business zone along University Drive, uh, Business Village Center, which includes the area around um, the intersection of Southeast Street and College Street and other areas in town. Um, the commercial District, which is uh, spotted around town. Office Park, which is on the east side of University Drive. The um, Limited Industrial District, which has two locations. One is um, near the railroad tracks, um, sort of east of where the high school is and one is in North Amherst, which is what Mr. Crowner just pointed out to us. So they are um, scattered around town in the business zones, the existing um, uses. Thank you. Um, way over there, second or maybe third row, I can't tell, white card. Janet, Mc Janet McGowan, Precinct 8. I know that Northampton has allowed um, 
retail sales and medicinal sales in their commercial and business districts. And um, it is moving its other kinds of manufacturing and grows and things to their light industrial and heavy industrial area. And there seems to be a sense to that where instead of sprinkling it all these businesses throughout their town, you know, you kind of know where everything can be and they all have sort of similar requirements. And this seems like a really odd strategy depending on who opens the store when. And I just wondered if you've looked at communities in California that have let in so many of these kind of businesses, how did they do their zoning? Did they go for the Northampton, like make sure the retail and medicinal sales are in the commercial or the business districts, but not letting these other kind of more industrial uses? and confining that to an area of town that's actually zoned for industry or light industry or research. Did you look at those examples and, and think about that? Ms. Prescott. So the areas that have been proposed for any type of manufacturing or testing or research are areas that already allow manufacturing, testing, or research of other materials, and this would just be allowing um, marijuana to also be tested or researched or manufactured in those zones. Um, in terms of retail sales, um, we tried to follow the lead of where our medical marijuana treatment center and our off-site medical marijuana dispensary is already allowed in those zones. Those are the zones where retail um, would be allowed. And the other um, uses such as cultivation, um, there really aren't very many good places in Amherst for cultivation. It requires a lot of um, building area or a new building. It requires a lot of water and um, sewer connection. And um, we really don't have appropriately large areas. We understand that people are looking for around 50,000 square feet um, to cultivate, unless it's a very small uh, entity like a micro business, which you do see listed here. And micro businesses are limited to 5,000 square feet, and I believe that one of the reasons that the state included micro-businesses in the list of marijuana uses was um, for social justice issues, that there would be certain uses that would be allowed um, and perhaps um, attainable by people who didn't have a lot of money. Um, what the state was afraid of was that um, large corporations from other states would come swooping in and really, you know, sort of take over the whole marijuana business. So they wanted some businesses that would be specifically small enough that a, a person could afford it or a person getting together with other people could afford it. Um, so um, I guess the bottom line is we don't think that Amherst is really a place where people are going to want to grow on a large scale. Um, and if you wanted to know more about that, the moderator might want to recognize uh, Jeff Kravitz, who, who knows a little more about that topic. Um, Mr. Kravitz? I, I think, I'll just point out that I think it's also not an apples to apples comparison with California. I mean, we've settled hundred years earlier, we've had a lot more um, time to develop. They have a lot more open space in a lot of those places and, and looking for sort of large scale uh, cultivation and manufacturing. Um, have not yet been approached by uh, any manufacturing companies specifically. Um, one micro business has come forward. Uh, a couple cultivation people have shown interest. Um, but again, not you know, we don't have large warehouses that have been sitting empty, and that's typically what, what these businesses are looking for, cheap space that isn't really fit out, and they can just start operations fairly quickly and easily. Thank you. Um, yes, third in from the aisle right there. Uh, Sarah LaCour, Precinct 9. Um, back to a couple of previous questions. Could we see the map of downtown and um, the question of where it might be allowed on that map. Uh, there's, that's our only business general uh, zone in the town. Mr. Crowner. Um, unfortunately, there really isn't many aren't many parcels available downtown. There, there really isn't. Um, that might be a problem. 
Ms. Breskrup. There are a few small places, and they are marked in yellow, particularly the one right in the middle of this map. Um, it is back by uh, Boltwood Walk, and there is one place there that, one or more places there, in a very small location that is not within 300 feet of any of the um, uses that we need to have a buffer against. Um, and there may be also places towards the south end of town, but again, this, these maps aren't exhaustive. They're meant to be kind of illustrative. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, one in from the aisle, three rows back. Marilyn Blaustein, Precinct 6. I call the previous question. Second. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. We will now come to an immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then come to a vote on Article 31. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Please say no. Our writer here is two-thirds. We now come to a vote on Article 31, which itself requires two-thirds vote for passage because it is a change to our zoning bylaws. All those in favor of the motion under Article 31, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's two-thirds. We will have an electronic vote. The result is 109 yes, 17 no. The article has passed. We now move on to Article 32. I call on Mr. Schreiber to make a motion. I move in terms of the article. Um, excuse me, Mr. Schreiber. Are you sure? No. <laughs> Let's try that again. Regent, that never happened. Regent. Mr. That never Schreiber. happened. I'm sorry. I move to dismiss the article. Do I hear a second? Motion is to dismiss. You may speak to your motion. Or Mr. Crowner, I'm not Mr. sure. Mr. Crowner. Mr. Crowner. Article 32 was, was incorporated into Article 31. It, um, it's, it's unnecessary to pass it again. And um, Ms. Brewer. Thank you. Um, and Select Board, I mean, Finance Committee has no position. This only requires a majority vote since we are dismissing it and not changing any zoning bylaw. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We will now come to a vote on Article 32. The motion is to dismiss. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. The ayes have it unanimously. And we now move on to Article 33. And I call on Mr. Bert Whistle to make a motion. Is it the article? Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Um, this is, uh, unlike many zoning articles, uh, pretty simple and straightforward. It may not, not to say that it's not controversial, but it's easy to understand. Basically, what we're trying to do is increase the options uh, for a variety of housing throughout town. As it has been said earlier this evening in other, in other um, uh, articles, there's a great need for housing of all kinds, affordable, at market rate, large, small. And this uh, particular article speaks only to the 
um, the attempt to gather a little more room for small-scale housing within existing neighborhoods. Basically what it does is raise the dimensional threshold from, for a, um, an, a supplemental dwelling unit from 800 square feet to 1,000 square feet. 900 or, 11, or 1,100, depending on whether it's uh, um, um, uh, um, handicapped ac accessible. Um, it's simply one strategy to uh, bring more diversity of housing to the downtown and to the neighborhoods and to the outlying areas. It, it operates in any zoning district where residential housing is allowed. Uh, there are cl clear limits on the size of the building relative to the uh, main structure. And probably most importantly, the requirement still exists that one of the two units, either the main unit or the supplementary dwelling unit, be occupied by the owner of the property. Uh, that would continue in any case, whether the property was transferred or sold, or um, it still has to have one of the two dwellings occupied by the owner of the property. Um, this is not going to solve all the Amherst housing problems. Uh, it is a step in the direction of solving one problem, one aspect of the problem, which is providing a little more variety and a little more flexibility for people who want to build a house on their own property. The planning department has received many requests for uh, permits for supplemental dwellings. Uh, and in, not infrequently, those requests end up saying, well, 800 square feet isn't really enough. We'd like to build a slightly larger house. Um, and this will accommodate those people. Uh, as I suggested before, this is a modest change, and uh, I hope you will support it. Thank you. Mr. Slaughter for the select board. I move to refer to the planning board. Do I hear a second? Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Are you confused? Confirming what we thought we voted. Yes, always a good idea. Okay. Leave it. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. You Make may speak sure. to your motion. Make sure I had this right. Well, the uh, select board is sympathetic to the to the uh, intent of this article in reviewing uh, advice by town council relative to the transition provisions uh, outlined in the new charter that's been adopted by the town. Uh, we felt that the that this article was one that did not meet the criteria of being consistent with those transition provisions. Uh, independent of, of our personal sympathies toward this particular article, we didn't find that it fell into the necessary and essential category, uh, nor did it have a, a situation where it was not admitting of delay is the term, but is, is of an urgency that needed action at this moment. Um, as such, we we offer the motion of referral to the, to the planning board. Thank you. So the motion on the floor now is the motion to refer, which will require majority for passage. If the motion to refer fails, we'd be back to the motion in terms of the article, which requires two thirds for passage since it is zoning bylaw. Um, does the finance committee have a recommendation or wish to speak? Yes, Mr. Neal. Uh, Tim Neal from the Finance Committee. We had a recommendation on the original motion, but this new motion to refer, we haven't had an opportunity to consult, so I would say we do not have a recommendation on the referral question. Okay, fair enough. Um, Ms. Kruger. The reason we were sort of consulting is, um, I think two meetings ago at the Select Board, um, we had many weeks before um, decided to set this one aside, and I asked that the select board reconsider this, and I believe at that time, two, week, two meetings ago, um, four of us voted in favor of this article with one voting no, but um, we have different memories of that, so um, that's, I'm trying to get a confirmation, but 
so in that way, I understand why the Finance Committee didn't get to vote on this, because I think we changed it, and we said we'd like to let the Planning Board know that we were, in fact, supporting it. But I don't have those minutes, so um, that's kind of where we're at. Okay. Ms. Brewer. So the reason this is so confusing is because of KP Law. <laughs> yeah, that's not entirely fair. But th we got guidance from them. It took a long time, but we got guidance from them as to what seemed, given the transition, that we should be acting on or not. So we felt we had to carve off certain things, saying these things are not time essential, do not, are, do not comport with their recommendations, even though they gave us a fairly large envelope to work within. You will hear about later articles that we also think are not appropriate for town meeting to act on at this time. This one was one that then after we found out that town meeting was in fact, go and the planning board was going to in fact go ahead and move this anyway, we said we're still gonna move to refer because it's in this other category, but if referral fails, we're gonna support the article. So, <laughs> it's a process issue is what it comes down to and it's how you all interpret how we interpreted, how KP Law interpreted the transitional provisions. But we did in fact vote to support it if referral fails. So you can hear that our referral is not like super enthusiastic maybe. Mm -hmm. And but that's the rationale. Um, and I'll call you in a second. I just want to point out that I got involved in the confusion as well. And I made a decision that even if the main motion on one of these articles was to refer dismiss because town council's opinion was that we shouldn't be working with it, my opinion was that every article has to be disposed of, so if a motion to refer or dismiss fails, I ruled that we would be considering the main motion and voting it up or down. So that's why if the refer fails, we do, we will still come before town meeting. Yes, over there. It seems to me that since the uh, select board is somewhat ambivalent about uh, their position uh, and the notion of referring to the planning board, an article that the planning board has been spent has spent a year or more uh, discussing and uh, coming to a clear proposal on, is uh, rather pointless. So I would hope that you would uh, vote against the referral of the article and then ultimately vote for the article. So the motion on the floor is a motion to refer, which requires a majority. If that passes, we've disposed of it. If that fails, we're back to the main motion, which requires two thirds. And yes, I see a red card halfway up there. Jerry Weiss, Precinct 8. Um, I just want to read to you from KP Law's opinion, just so everybody can have that, because I don't think everybody's got the document. Uh, Amherst Town Meeting Articles 33 and 35 and the petition to Article 36 propose amendments to existing zoning bylaws and raise similar issues. Articles 33 and 35 propose to allow the town to better implement existing bylaws intended to encourage affordable housing. The subject matter of these bylaws has been discussed for several years. These amendments have been proposed and vetted by the planning board through work by staff and the public hearing process. It's hard to hold this. And approval thereof will allow the town to more easily facilitate the creation of affordable housing and to enforce the existing bylaws. Failure to take action on these bylaws now will mean that the town will continue. Your microphone went off. Da, da, da. There you go. It's on. Um, failure to take action on these bylaws now will mean that the town will continue to face challenges in implementing the current bylaws. And in light of the number of months before such matter can be addressed by the town council, may well result in the loss of potential units in the meantime, frustrating a long recognized goal of the town. For those reasons, in my opinion, Amherst Town Meeting Articles 33 and 35 are appropriate for action by town meeting. Uh, it goes on to discuss 36 and 35, which I won't do now. Are we ready to vote on the motion to refer? Um, yes, I see a hand there. Chris Riddle, Chris Riddle, Precinct 2. Um, 
I, 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 this is relates to the other articles that we will that will come before us with either a, a recommendation recommendation for dismissal or referral. Um, these are all articles. This is uh, that have been appeared on the warrant. Um, I, my question is, I guess this is a, a question that implies that I would reject the idea of not considering these things, um, is that what harm does it do for a town meeting to uh, deliberate and decide on these articles that have appeared on the warrant in front of us that are for our consideration if it turns out that, uh, uh, that the that powers that be later on disagree with our decision um, uh, that so be it, but I, I would tend to suggest in all of these conditions that we just go ahead and consider these articles. A lot of them have a lot of uh, uh, pros and cons that we should deliberate. I, I, I would suggest that we should all consider all of the articles that are on the warrant and uh, dispense with them. And then, if it turns out that they are uh, that that town council C O U N C I L. C-O-U-N-C-I-L, um, uh, disagrees with our ruling, well, okay, that's fine. Why well, I think we should consider the, all of these things. Thank you. Ready to come to a vote on the motion to refer. Um, I see a hand right in the front row here. And it had a green card attached to it. True enough. I vote to refer, but not for the reasons that were stated by the select board. I'm actually voting um, to... Identify yourself, please. Sorry, Carol Gray, Precinct 7. I'm wanting to refer because I would vote no on the original article. Um, I'm just trying to read it very carefully, and uh, what I see is that there's a word detached added. It says, the new bolded language says, any supplemental detached dwelling unit. So that means you can build a new unit um, in your backyard, I guess. Um, but when I look at the definition in the zoning bylaw for, for example, supplemental apartment, it says a supplemental apartment which is located entirely within an existing one family detached dwelling and requires no significant external changes to the dwelling. In other words, it's one thing to have an apartment that's part of your own house and you want to um, have your grandmother come and stay in that apartment. It's another thing to say that you could start constructing little um, you know, dorm-like and <laughs> buildings in your backyard that could be used by people that, in other words, you know, residential neighborhoods could become more rental properties. And I think we should think about, um, I, it's, I guess I just say it, it's not quite as simple as I think it was um, originally seemed to be. Like if it's, it looks to me like the previous language was talking about all within one building. And it looks like when you add in the bolded language any supplemental detached dwelling unit, and you also add supplemental apartment one and supplemental apartment two, it seems like it's doing something a little bit different. And um, I would vote no because I think we need more discussion. And this was started eight minutes before 10, and it's zoning. And um, I'm going to vote to refer. I'm Ms. Brestrup. Um, there is already a supplemental detached dwelling unit section of the bylaw. It's section 5.0111. Um, it describes what a supplemental detached dwelling unit is. These are already allowed in the residential districts in town, um, and they can be up to 800 square feet or up to 900 square feet if they're fully handicapped accessible. So this um, bylaw amendment is merely allowing them to be a little bit larger. Thank you. Um, yeah, in the back corner there. Um, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. I, I actually, I considered supporting the select board motion to refer um, because I think this article should be referred. On the other hand, I, I really think that um, the statement of a previous speaker persuaded me that we should consider our, our, all the articles on the warrant and if the uh, the town wants to sue itself over what we've done, then they will be entertained by their activities. Um, uh, but we, so we should consider the article, but I think we should defeat it. Um, and, I, and, and I was in town meeting, and a number of people 
uh, here we're in town meeting when the detached supplemental apartment um, issue was brought before town meeting was passed over the objections of some of us who, who don't believe that there ought to be separate um, you, you two separate uses on the same parcel if you put them in the same building that's fine but to have separate houses appear in people's backyards is, is not a good idea. We, one of the assurances that was made to town meeting when the detached supplemental apartment proposal was thing is that it would be limited in size. And now, not very many years later, we come back with a proposal to increase the size uh, that, was, that we were assured um, should be, uh, you know, would be what it was originally. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the neighborhood salami is being sliced again. I, I really think that this proposal, the motion to refer should be defeated and the article should be defeated because it really violates, uh, the article does, violates an assurance that the town meeting was given not many years ago that this supplemental apartment thing would not be, grow into essentially another house. And um, so uh, please vote no on the motion to refer, and please vote no on the article. Thank you. Yes, third row right here. Andy Churchill, Precinct 3. Um, I don't feel particularly strongly about this article, but in my role as Charter Commission Chair Emeritus, I feel like um, I should at least make people aware of a letter that um, I and the Vice Chair Mandy Johanneke sent to the select board and the town manager and the moderator prior to town meeting, um, expressing our concerns about articles 33 through 36. And I think we're setting a precedent here that then would be extended to those other articles if, if I didn't mention it now. So uh, we said, we write to express our opinion that articles 33 through 36 on the current warrant should not be brought to town meeting based on language in the new charter approved by the voters on March 27th. All four of those articles concerned zoning, which was identified in the Charter Commission's deliberations as one of the most problematic aspects of Amherst town meeting form of government. The commission therefore put in place a new system in which zoning proposals would receive thoughtful and in-depth discussion in the context of a council approved master plan prior to a vote. Furthermore, the commission included a transition provision specifically to prevent last minute proposals that were not urgent and that might frustrate the purpose of the charter, limiting town meeting actions to quote, those matters essential and necessary to the current operations of the town. Unlike the marijuana articles on the spring 2018 warrant, which address a state deadline that comes before the election of the new council. Articles 33 through 36 are not urgent and they are not necessary to the current operations of the town. Given that the voters have spoken and we are now in a transition period to the new government, we believe it is the intent of both the charter and the voters who approved it that the remaining town meetings should be as short and as non-controversial as possible. Because Articles 33 through 36 are not urgent and could be seen as frustrating a purpose of the Charter, that is, thoughtful consideration of zoning proposals within the context of a Council-approved master plan, we respectfully request that those articles be removed from the warrant prior to the Spring 2018 Town Meeting. Um, so I understand that the, the um, Select Board was under the impression that they needed to approve the warrant as it was submitted to them at that time, that they got the KP law advice and decided to let town meeting consider all of the articles. Um, but um, it, it's my opinion and that of my co-chair that the articles 33 through 36 um, should not be approved because they do conflict with the provision of the charter that I just read. Thank you. Ready to come to a vote. I hear a point of order. Precinct 9. Do we have a quorum here tonight? Are you formally requesting yes. a quorum yes, count? Yes, I am. Yes. Are you, I, I'm, I'm looking around and I'm counting. And I don't okay. think we have a quorum. We will have an electronic vote. Everybody press either yes or no or abstain to be counted. 
I do, Mr. Gadara, Mr. Gadara, are you a town meeting member? Yes. Then would you please come down into the? Okay, good. We're going to wait until you're down in the audience. I hear a point of order. I, I am a little concerned about doing it by clickers. I, I noticed last time that we did this, there was a member of the select board that did not vote. And I, you know, I'm just saying maybe we need to count. No, I ruled that a clicker is the way we're doing it. It's the equivalent of somebody walking out if they don't want to be counted. I would urge everybody who's here, including me, the moderator, to press their clicker. We all have the same interest, which is disposing of every article on the warrant so we can have a budget and spend money and do things like that this year. Um, I hear another point of order. Maria Kapicki, Precinct 8. Are all town meeting members down front? Um, if they're not, then they're choosing. They're, it's the equivalent of leaving. They're choosing not to be counted. Are, are there any town meeting members? Are there any town meeting members who are not in the seats in the auditorium? Um, and is it because you're physically unable to sit? Okay, please come into the auditorium, sir. Hey, nobody else can talk without recognition by the moderator, please. Okay, we are now going to have an electronic vote to see if we have a quorum. A quorum is 125, just so you know. And we have 132, we may continue. Is there more discussion before we come to a vote on the point of order, I'm hoping it's a really good one. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, Jim Oldham, Precinct 5, are we or are we not required, if we want to participate in town meeting as voting members and be recognized, to stay in this section throughout? Back before we had clickers, we wouldn't be recognized for a vote if we weren't in this section. Now we're doing electronic votes, and it seems that people think maybe they can vote from the hallway. Okay, question is heard. And yes, town meeting members are required to be in the main section of the auditorium. Um, obviously, people need to go to the bathroom sometimes, so we're not going to have armed guards keeping them from wandering out. But I ask town meeting members to stay in the... Excuse me. Question has been asked and answered. I ask and request the town meeting members stay in the auditorium. Is there still a point of order? Yes. Okay, wait for my microphone and identify yourself. Amy Middleman, Precinct 5. Someone up there just gave a, uh, a very foul symbol to town meeting. Well, that's very unfortunate, and all I can say is that person is immature, and we need to all ignore that person. Okay? Um, are we ready to come to a vote on the motion to refer? Um, is there a point of order? Then let's have a m microphone, please. Mr. Oldham has another point of order, apparently. Oh, he called his first. Is it or is it not acceptable to be sitting up there with a clicker prepared to vote on the motion that you're trying to get us to vote on? I am requesting, I am requesting all town meeting members who want to vote or discuss on articles to come down into the house. If you're a town meeting member and you're up in the balcony, you shouldn't be voting. You should come down to the house. Mr. Gadara, is that you up there? Are you a town meeting member? Are you a town meeting member, sir? I am requesting, Mr. Gadara, could you come down here and talk to me, please? Could you come down here and talk to me, please? If everybody could just be patient. Excuse me. 
You cannot speak. Mr. Gadara, could you please come up here? Mr. Gadara, could you please come up here or leave the auditorium? What I tell my middle school kids all the time is that, that if somebody does something mean or rotten or nasty to you, you do not do something mean or rotten or nasty back to them. That should apply to adults as well as to children, and I expect it to apply to everyone in town meeting. Is that understood? Are you ready to come to a vote on the motion to refer? I see a white card in the front there. Yes, John Fox, Precinct 10. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I wonder if you could clarify for us about the importance of the legal opinion that the select board got with respect to the articles that were just addressed by a prior speaker and the relevance of members of the Charter Commission who object to the uh, consideration of these articles giving a different legal interp interpretation to the charter itself. So I assume that we turn to legal counsel uh, for an opinion that would be the most important opinion for us to consider and not weigh the opinion of a member of the Charter Commission that conflicts with that. Can you please advise us on that? Yes. Um, so first of all, that word opinion is the really important one. So it's the opinion of town council that certain articles should be considered by town meeting, others should not. It's the opinion of some members of the Charter Commission, which may or may not still exist. I can't quite, I don't know. Um, and he says no. It's the opinion of some other people in town meeting that they shouldn't be. Other things should or shouldn't be considered. Everybody has their opinions and are entitled to them. In terms of what town meeting considers and what town meeting votes on, my opinion counts more than other people's opinion. <laughs> and I listened carefully and talked with counsel. I read very carefully the letter Mr. Churchill sent, which is a very respectful letter. There was nothing in it that upset me particularly. My opinion is still that if something is on the warrant, it must be disposed of. And by definition, if it's not disposed of by referral or dismissal, then we're back to a main motion, or I'll request that some other motion be made that town meeting rules on. So that's my opinion, that town meeting must dispose of every article and if you don't dispose of it by referral or dismissal, then there has to be a main positive motion that we dispose on. It's also my opinion that voting to refer versus voting against the main motion, while symbolic, have no actual different effect from each other. I'm answering that now in case somebody asks. We're now back to the question on whether or not it's a discussion on the motion to refer this article. And yes, I see a card right there, third in. Amanda Robertson, Precinct 5, I need to call the question. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. If two-thirds of you vote, we will then immediately come to a vote on the motion for referral. All those in favor of the motion of the previous question, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's two-thirds. We now come to immediate vote on the motion to refer. And if a majority vote yes, then the motion is referred and the article, I mean, the article is referred and disposed of. All those in favor, and this is Article 33. I almost forgot, so maybe others did. All those in favor of the motion to refer Article 33 back to the planning board, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The noes have it. We now have the main motion on the floor. Um, I'd appreciate that we end debate soon, because I think we've said lots of stuff about it, but if there's more discussion, we will entertain it. So, yes, I see it. Um, actually, a hand there instead. Somebody I haven't heard from, I don't think. Alex Lefebvre, Alex Lefebvre Precinct 10. Um, so, we were actually one of the first people to go through the special permitting process um, with the detached housing for our house. Um, we have a house in town, and we have a carriage house behind our house. We're a multi-generational family, and redoing our carriage house, our actual space was larger than 800 square feet. Uh, it was probably about 1,000 square feet. So we wound up only doing 800 square feet of our carriage house, which my in-laws now live in. 
So I'm going to support this article because um, I, I think people are concerned about student housing, but for us, we live downtown, it's a multi-generational house, and it allowed us to have our in-laws move into an existing space and renovate that space. And so for that reason, I'm in favor of this article so other people can take advantage of the same thing we did. Thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Neal. Okay, uh, Tim Neal, Finance Committee. For the record, for this article, the Finance Committee voted six to zero in favor, in part because we felt this small change might induce some small increase in property value and thus some more income potentially to the town. Thank you. Um, I see a hand kind of towards the back there. That's you, yes. Dorothy Pam, Precinct 10. When I go out my back door, I live between Lincoln and Sunset. It's 10 to 20 degrees cooler in my backyard than in the front. We voted to support trying to do something uh, to prevent more climate change of the negative type. 800 feet is a still a big enough place, I think. And if, you, if we fill in all the backyards and cut down more trees, we will then increase the temperature of the town of Amherst. And I think that what happens in somebody else's backyard does, in fact, affect all of us in terms of trees and the workings of them to bring a better climate. Um, yes, right there in the front row. Microphone. Uh, John Hornick, Precinct 7, also speaking in favor on behalf of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, which voted seven to zero with one person absent at its meeting last Thursday uh, on, to support this uh, warrant article. Um, basically, um, we're in agreement with the reasons that the planning board has stated for this article. While there is clearly no requirement that these be affordable, because of their size, they are frankly more likely to be, so they likely will add to the stock of affordable housing in town. Um, we can also ask whether or not there be poor design because they are very small houses. I want to point out that if anybody looks online for small houses or tiny houses, you can see a plethora of designs that are available to people who want to take this step. A lot of them are quite interesting. In fact, the city of Northampton, in collaboration with uh, Pioneer Valley Habitat, the Western Mass Architects Association, I think it was, and one other organization I'm forgetting, recently held a competition in which 16 architects or architectural practices submitted designs for tiny houses online. You can find all this by Googling the Northampton competition. So basically what I say is there's been a lot of work, not only in this area, but around the country, around good design for tiny houses. And I think, and I think the trust supports this, that we really do need to encourage this kind of development in Amherst. So I would urge you also to support this article. Thank you. Are we ready to come to a vote? Well, no, you can't answer vocally. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. If you're, raise your hand if you're not intending to call the previous question. I mean, if, keep, your, keep your card up. In that case, um, now everybody can raise their cards again. So I just, I didn't want to call, yeah. Fourth in from the aisle right there. Hi, I, um, this is Lisa Berry, Precinct 2. I just had a couple questions. Um, number one, who ensures the, that the owners are still living on the property years after these things are built? And also, how does, this, how does this play out in the historical district of town? Ms. Breskrop. The building commissioner is ultimately responsible for whether or not someone is complying with a special permit. These units all require a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, 
normally when uh, there's a transition from an owner occupancy to a non-owner occupancy, neighbors will uh, notify us immediately. Um, but there are also inspectors who drive around and uh, figure things out too. Thank you. And up against the wall way over there. Chief Bolden, Precinct 5. I, I want to support this. I, I support the, the vision behind this. I support the goal of having more small housing. I'm, I'm comfortable with, with the infill, with the affordability of this and so on. But I think the last speaker uh, hit with her question, hit precisely my, my big concern. And I think that what we have seen in practice, we, we have um, times where duplexes are also uh, require owner occupancy. And what we've been seeing in town is our zoning board of appeals wave, removing that owner occupancy requirement so that we have it, we think it's our protection, and it doesn't really work. And I think it's a, sh it's a real struggle for me to know what the solution is because you build buildings, that's, I mean, zoning is about buildings. Zoning is about land and buildings. It's about structures. And it's really hard to have a zoning bylaw that says owner occupancy. And in fact, I don't think it works. So I would love to hear people uh, from the planning board or anyone else speak to how we can do this because we live in a town where non-owner occupancy of dense, multi-unit uh, buildings in residential neighborhoods means overcrowded, unregulated rental housing. And that can be a real problem. Ms. Brestrup. So in this case, um, the supplemental dwelling unit has a condition that is um, in the zoning bylaw that doesn't have an option for being modified. And it says one of the dwelling units on the property shall be occupied by the owner of the principal one family residence, which requirement shall be made a condition of any special permit issued under this section. So it's both in the bylaw and it would also be a condition of the special permit. Um, the fact that it's in the bylaw and does not have an opportunity to be waived or modified means that it's, it's, it's a real condition. Ready to come to a vote. Um, yes, second from the back on the aisle there. Herb Rose, Precinct 7. Uh, although I think I'm going to vote in favor of this article, I am terrified of it uh, because uh, I think of certain sections of town that have very modest houses on them with very large lots. We could see the doubling of the density in that a, a particular area. Uh, I, 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 I have no idea how this is going to be controlled. Um, and, and we're all of a sudden single family houses on very large lots uh, have, construct a thousand foot, thousand square foot dwelling unit and starts renting them out. Uh, and all of a sudden on these uh, particular streets, we see the density increase dramatically. Um, yes, back of the aisle there. Aaron Hayden, uh, Precinct 8, formerly a member of the planning board. And I believe uh, while I was on the select board, actually, that um, I just want to remind everybody that we put into place the uh, rental inspection program. Um, the, I, this, the concern that has been expressed about policing uh, the home ownership has been something that we've been working with for a while, and that was the one thing that we've tried. Um, I wish uh, Mr. Morrow were here to tell us exactly how well that program is going uh, to uh, maybe assure us so we don't, needn't be so frightened of this uh, rather beneficial uh, uh, amendment. Thank you. If Mr. Morrow would like to be recognized, I'll recognize him. It looks like he's coming forward. Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. Uh, point about the rental registration program, we do spend uh, some time uh, periodically 
uh, looking over the transfers, and that's generally how we become aware of um, owner-occupied properties, uh, at least appearing that they become non-owner-occupied, and that causes us to reach out to the property owner and find out exactly what the status is at that point. Um, otherwise, we do rely a lot on complaints. We certainly do not have uh, staff out patrolling looking for this exact situation. Uh, the owner occupancy conditions that are placed uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeals on the special permits are documents that are recorded at the Registry of Deeds connected to the title. Uh, during the transfers, we'll often hear from uh, land use attorneys uh, trying to understand exactly what those conditions are. Uh, so we are, you know, we, we deal with this quite regularly. Uh, and feel like we, we, make, we do make an effort to uh, try to identify those properties. Thank you. Um, third row back on the aisle there. Jeff Blaustein, Precinct 6. I call the previous question. Second. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. We will come to an immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then come to a vote on Article 33. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's two thirds. We now come to a vote on the main motion under Article 33, which is in terms of the article. And it requires a two thirds vote for passage. All those in favor of the motion under Article 33, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. no. Moderators in doubt, we'll have an electronic vote. The vote is yes, 63, no, 56. So Article 33 has not passed. I hear a point of order. Well, it's too late to have a quorum on that vote. And I believe the next motion is going to be a motion to adjourn, which you can have even if you don't have a quorum. So I don't think a quorum count is necessary. I hear a point of order. Um, we, we weren't even close to two-thirds, so you can come up to the clerk and let her know. Yeah. Okay. If any other people have issues, you can come up and report to the clerk what your vote was. Before I call on Mr. Slaughter, I want to remind people of things. His first motion is going to be to adjourn to tomorrow. If that fails, it's next Monday. But even more important, Turn off and return your electronic voting devices, clean up your trash, and be here on time for the next meeting. Mr. Slaughter. I move to adjourn till Thursday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Motion has been made and seconded to adjourn to tomorrow night. This is not debatable. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. The no's have it. Um, Mr. Slaughter, try again. I move to adjourn till Monday, May 21st at 7 p.m. That's been made and seconded. Um, all those in favor of adjourning to next Monday, May 21st, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. no. We are adjourned.